Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth, the John Campion Show, coming from right here on my YouTube channel. I am, of course, your host, John Campion, and it is an awesome honor and privilege, as it is every day, to have you, my international friends, gather around the virtual water cooler with me as we talk about our favorite things in the world, movies and movie news and all sorts of good stuff. And I trust that you guys are having a fabulous day already, and you're doing the four important things, guys. Stay smart, stay safe, take care of yourselves, and take care of the people around you. And if you do, we're all going to have a much better day. And and making it a better day here, I'm joined, of course, here on th this Thursday, of course, by Aaron Cummings. Aaron, how you doing? I'm actually doing fantastic, John, and I will tell you why. For people that have been following me on social media, you know, I've been posting a lot about my friend Nick Cordero, yes, Broadway star. Yes, I was going to ask you about that. And good Canadian kid, That's by the right. way. Um, he has he was diagnosed with COVID-19 and has been in a coma for about two weeks now. Uh, we had a really, really, really bad weekend last weekend, uh, and he was put on a lot of machines but every day we've been singing and dancing and throwing out tons and tons of positive energy uh, just to give a little bit of spiritual supplement to what the incredible doctors and nurses and staff are doing over at Cedar sinai and uh, he's made a turn back in the right direction and we're hoping that he will be able to come off the machines starting today so if you guys out there could just give a little bit of love to nick cordero he's a broadway star he's here in la doing rock of ages which is where why i'm wearing my rock of ages pin you know it's my favorite show um follow uh on my social media and i'll give you all the information there but let's Give some positive energy to Nick and everybody else out there who is uh, struggling against this horrible disease. Yeah, because I know you, when you and I were talking about about this last time, you know, you're really obviously extremely concerned. And yeah, uh, but it's always good when to hear good news like that. So that's Ooh. exciting to hear. Yeah. Um, hey, listen, guys, we do have a lot of stuff that we need to talk about here today, and I think we're going to get into some interesting debate because I think there's a number of issues up here today that I think we're going to have some very interesting fundamental differences of opinion. But that's when it's the best time to be a film fan is when you can have some fundamental differences opinion listen we're going to talk about you know fantastic four is coming is joss whedon going to direct that well there might be a better chance for that than you might think we'll talk about that in just a little bit parasite setting some records on hulu can halloween beat the existing october opening weekend box office record it's actually got a shot even given the current circumstances we'll talk about that in a little bit but before we get to all of that Let's do one off the top. Oh, and actually, before we get to the off the tops, I want to remind you guys about a couple of things. Uh, number one, and I'll be reminding you about this for the next couple of weeks. For years, we've I've had people ask me for an audio-only version of the show. Of course, an audio-only version podcast of the show has been a perk of our Patreon supporters. But our Patreon supporters in late 2019 said, you know what? Let everybody have it. That's perfectly fine. So... The John Campia audio-only podcast version of the show is now available uh, up on your favorite podcast uh, app of choice, and it's on the charts, and it's all that kind of stuff, and we're very excited, so thank you to all you guys who have been listening. So, you know, it's best to watch the show on YouTube, sure, but for those times that you're driving in your car, you're on your treadmill, sometimes at work it's easier to listen to something than it is to watch something on YouTube, then there it is. That's there for you. You can go and find it. Go and subscribe to that right now. The other thing I want to let you guys know about is I've had a bunch of people asking me all the time about all the gear that I use. Now, I will be doing a, a video here sometime in the next few weeks, kind of giving you guys the tour of the studio and showing you specifically all the gear that I use. But for now, uh, what I've done is I've put together an actual list of all the gear that I use, and I'm using Amazon affiliate links. So if you buy something from there, Amazon gives me a little bit of cut, uh, kickback. You know what? They started paying my wife. Damn it, they can start paying me. Um, <laughs> anyway, so it, it's over there. And every week, I'm also changing things at the top about the things things that I love this week, including things I have, like my Elgato Scream Deck. Of course, my hat that I love. Oh, my God. And a black and white Alfred Hitchcock pop. And then, of course, all the gear that I use. That's there if you guys want to go check that out. You can simply find that at my website at thejohncampiashow.com slash shop so that's the john campia show.com slash shop that's where you're going to find all that stuff there and you can check that out okay guys with that down and out of the way let's get in to our off the top and our off the top is an interesting one here and maybe one that i actually should have made a, a main topic but it's really something i wasn't even going to talk about till i saw how many people online were actually getting very very upset about this so what's going on well here's the deal you guys are familiar, of course, with the great Tom Hanks, Daryl Hannah film Splash. Well, they now put that on Disney+. Plus. For the most part, like 99%, Splash is an incredibly family-friendly film. However, there's one shot in Splash 
There's one shot in Splash where you see Tom Hanks and Daryl Hannah share a kiss on a beach, and then the shot has Daryl Hannah turning around because she's a mermaid, so she's naked because that's what mermaids do, and she turns <laughs> around and runs to the beach, and for the ever briefest of moments, you see, you know, Daryl Hannah's bare ass. Okay. Disney Plus, of course, is a more family-friendly kind of platform, so what Disney Plus did to work around this was they got some of their CG artists to, in that shot, when Daryl Hannah runs into the water, they just CGI'd her hair to be longer. And so this longer CGI hair just covers her ass as she's running into the water. So it's the same shot, nothing has changed, it's just that they have her hair being a little bit longer to cover the ass to make it appropriate for Disney Plus. Fine. What I was not personally prepared for was exactly how many people would be up in arms about this and actually be quite upset by this. Like, you'd be surprised, quite upset by this, um, dare I say. And it's it's kind of, it's a little bit confusing to me, but here's the basic debate that is revolved around this. And I'm sure we're going to have some difference of opinion on here, and I'm and I welcome it. So here we go. The basic fundamental underlying argument for people who are upset by this is this is censorship. Now, you already know my feeling on that. It's not censorship. Censorship is when somebody else forces you to do something that you don't want to do. If you like if the government comes in and says you have blue walls, you're not allowed to have blue walls, paint your blo your walls white and they force you to paint your walls white. Well, that's kind of artistic expression in your own home censorship. But if it's your wall and you just decide I want to paint my walls white, well, that's on you. You're not censoring the color blue. It's your wall. You can do whatever you're damn well pleased with it. Splash is now a property of Disney. And if they want to extend the hair over her butt fine that that's their prerogative to do it's their thing i don't like this i don't like the changes that the star wars special edition did i don't like those changes but i've never once thought for a second that you know george lucas didn't have the right to make those changes when he made them it, they were his movies at the time he can do whatever he wants i didn't like it but i didn't have a problem with it i don't like the changes I hate the Jedi Rock song. I hate that they took out the the um, Ewok music at the end of Return of the Jedi. I don't like it, but I have no problem with it because it's George Lucas's movie. He can do whatever he wants to do. So it's not censorship. Disney's doing something with their own film. It wasn't censorship when George Lucas changed his own film. It's not censorship here. But whether it's censorship or not, it still raises an interesting question that some people are rightfully raising online. At what point should we say that art, in whatever form, it shouldn't be meddled with and changed once it's done? And I think there's a discussion there to be had. And, and that, for the most part, is what I'm seeing most people who have a problem with this whole splash situation. It's not that they're saying, we think it's censorship. No, most people aren't saying that. What they are saying, though, is you can't just go and rewrite history. You can't just go and change art after the fact to suit your current senses and sensibilities. They believe, and it's always, you don't want to get into slippery slope arguments, but sometimes it's applicable, and some people feel like <laughs> this is a bit of a slippery slope. Now, once you start doing this, another thing. Here's my take on this, Aaron. And I don't know if you're going to have a fun, I don't know if we're about to have a, an intellectual throwdown here or not. I really not. hope so. Um, but so here's, here's my take on this. I love it when we this. debate, I, I do too, but here's my take on this, all right? Mm -hmm. I think it's perfectly reasonable and understandable for people to see what Disney just did covering Daryl Hannah's ass, which should never be covered, by the way. Agreed. Just want to throw that out there. Agreed. But with Disney covering Daryl Hannah's ass, I understand and relate with the idea of not liking it and not agreeing with it because I didn't agree with the, the changes George Lucas made to Star Wars. I, I mean, I didn't like it. But I don't see why anybody would have a problem with it here's the thing movies going on television have always edited and we've always understood oh yeah because on this network it's not appropriate to have certain material so they changed the f-bombs to frosted flakes instead of you know mother effer it's right. you know, moose frosty whatever they change the things and we we don't have a problem with that sam jackson calling saying he's a badass mother flipper yes yeah oh my god that's always the best when that happens i remember well, okay anyway i won't go into that story i won't get <laughs> sidetracked here but you know we we understand that disney plus 
is a broadcast platform. Mm -hmm. It's a little different than that it's on streaming, but it's still essentially a broadcast platform. And they decided, well, you know, we would like, this is mostly a very, very family-friendly movie. It's 99.9% mm -hmm. .9 very fa family-friendly. We would like to have it on Disney+. Plus. The bare ass shot might be a little bit questionable. Okay, we're not gonna change the movie. We're not gonna cut scenes out. We're not gonna replace digitally replace one actor with another. We're just gonna say her hair's a little longer so it covers her nudity. Right. That's it. I understand not liking it. I understand thinking, eh, if I was Disney, I wouldn't have done that. I get that. But I don't understand the notion of saying, I have a problem with this. Right. I just I just don't see it from either a censorship point of view because it's not censorship but also from this whole slippy slope argument because television has been doing it forever. Now, I've heard some people say, well, if you didn't want the bare ass on Disney+, Plus, then you shouldn't have it on Disney+. Plus." Okay, but that's like saying to television networks all through the decades that have broadcast some of our favorite movies, saying, well, if you don't want to include the F-bombs, don't have it on your broadcast right. network. We've never made that argument because we all know that argument is stupid. So that's why we've none of us have ever made that argument. Mm -hmm. I, now, listen. I don't want to set a precedent here that says I think it's okay to just go back and change movies and change history and all that kind of stuff. I don't. But in a specific circumstance like this, where for their broadcast network, just like CBS would do, just like NBC would do, just like Fox would do, just like whatever network would do, saying we want to put this on our network, but there's a part here, and instead of cutting the scene out, listen, instead of cutting the scene out, what Disney did was... Let's make sure we leave the scene in. We'll put a little bit extra money into it and we'll just have the hair be longer so it's no problem for anybody. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I just feel like this is a case of the internet because I do this and you do this. I feel like this is just a case of we the internet complaining for the sake of complaining. Right. But I, I don't know. I think there's a lot of different ways of looking at this and you do want to be careful, but I think in this specific circumstances, that's how I see it. Okay, I've set it up, I explain the situation. Aaron. Mm -hmm. Disney has covered Daryl Hannah's ass, which we all agree is a fallacy. But, Agreed. But in this specific circumstance, <laughs> do you, as an artist yourself and as an mm -hmm. actor in the arts, do you have a fundamental problem with this or do you think this is something that is much ado about nothing? How do you see it? It's completely much ado about nothing. As you said, this has been happening since the beginning of when films were then aired for television. They were always edited for television for language, for violence, for nudity, for sexual situations. Um, when you go and you watch a movie on an airplane, there is always going to be some level of, uh, you know, you don't want to see someone having a full nude sex scene in the seat next to you. Although I think now it's a little bit more open with the streaming you know, networks, but th there was a lot of censorship there. And yes, somebody's probably saying, oh my gosh, but what about Booksmart? And that was a whole thing. That was, that Booksmart controversy was different because it was actually um, based on uh, uh, discrimination. But back to Splash, the same thing happened like with with Spartacus in the original Spartacus when my character of Sura was being taken away by the Romans. I was topless when the television show was then sold to, I think it was like WGN or TNT, whoever ended up buying it. And it was going to be broadcast to a broader network and had to be censored, which I can't even understand how they were able to take out so much of the sexuality and the nudity in Spartacus because it was kind That's of... a lot. It was a lot. <laughs> Spartacus, uh, uh, Spartacus boobs and blood is what people used to call <laughs> it. But in the edited version, a piece of red CGI blanket, similar to the blanket that was around my waist, was just placed over my breast. And it didn't take anything away from the story. It didn't mean that anything had changed. It just meant, okay, for this particular platform, we don't need to see her boobs. If you really want to see Daryl Hannah's butt, you can probably go to MrSkin.com and you can find it with the click of a button. And if your version of Splash that you really want to watch has Daryl Hannah's full butt in it, you can probably order the DVD or the Blu-ray online. Um, Disney, as we've talked about many, many times on this show, Disney Plus is a wonderful platform if you are a parent and you want to stick your kid in front of the television and say okay I know that you can flip to any single uh, you can watch anything on Disney Plus you want and I don't have to worry about it 
if we start opening the door to saying, okay, well, it's fine to have Daryl Hannah's butt. Okay, well, a nipple's not that bad. Okay, like where, Once you start opening that door, when you have a platform that had previously said, hey, you don't have to worry. Now, some families might say, it's, a, it's the human body, it's anatomy, it's no big deal. But, but that's other, a different debate. That's right, exactly. A, yeah. I, no, I, that's what I'm saying is like Disney Plus, their job is not to decide what is or is not appropriate for you and your family to watch. Their job is to say, okay, these are the properties that we own and we want to make sure that we are following as much of a family-friendly environment as possible. And so I think that they're doing a really smart thing. And also, how many times do you listen to um, you know, songs on the radio um, Eminem songs that are bleeped out. Oh that, yeah, all the time. All the time. All the time. And, no, and people understand. Okay, that's because this is for a wider audience. If I want to listen to the un the un censored version of that song or the non-radio friendly version of that song, I'll go and download it on iTunes and I'll pay my dollar twenty nine for it. So if you want to see the version that it was originally intended as, just go buy it. Because I I could I almost guarantee that the people that have the biggest issue with this are not people who are going to go watch Splash on Disney Plus anyway. Like, are these people really, are, was, was that really what you wanted to do? Were we really like, oh my God, I can't wait to go watch Disney Plus so I can see Splash and see Daryl Hannah's butt. Come on. Yeah, I mean, look, I, and I think there's also an interesting thing here about uh, arguments that have often been made about uh, remakes. It's like some people act as if when a remake gets made, that yeah. means the network is going to send out a cat burglar to your house in the middle of the night, sneak into your home, steal your original version of that movie, and you can never watch the original again. Right. And I feel like, look, there's other avenues to watch Splash that you can, I can still order Splash on Amazon Prime and, and things like 100%. that and pay for it and watch it. I, I just don't see the problem. And again, I don't want to get into the slippery slope argument because there's already precedence for this. Some people also say, well, Disney Plus has Hulk's bare bottom in that scene in Thor Ragnarok for a moment. True, but just like we always talk about on this show with violence, right? You can show Transformers and in a PG-13 thing, you can have Transformers going and you can have Optimus Prime cut off the head of a Decepticon. If it's a mythical creature, if it's CG animated, there's a lot more leeway there, right? Just like we see Thanos get his cut off. He's a CG mythical creature monster. It's not a real human being, blah, blah. There, now, right, you can agree or disagree with that, but the fact of the matter is because it's CG, we tend to give it a lot more leeway. And I think the same is true with a shot like that, is that, well, with Hulk, he's a mythological creature, it's a CG thing, they give it a little bit more leeway. Right, they wouldn't show Bruce Banner's butt. No, they wouldn't, have, yeah, exactly. They wouldn't have shown uh, Mark Ruffalo naked. So right. I don't know. And Although we, they should. Right, and we can get it, you can get into the argument about what should and shouldn't be considered family friendly, but that's not what the issue on the table is. Right. The issue on the table is, is it understandable that Disney, for their platform, feels mm -hmm. like we want to show this movie that we have the rights to, but just like every other television broadcaster in history has always edited the stuff for broadcast, and we understand that that's not censorship per se, I don't see a problem with it. Now, I'm already anticipating most people are going to disagree. So, I made that the topic of today's question of the day. And earlier, much, much earlier this morning, I put this up on my Twitter to ask you guys, what do you think about this? Over 3,200 of you guys responded, and I simply asked, with what? Disney Plus... With Disney Plus putting CGI longer hair to cover Daryl Hannah's bare rear, is it perfectly okay to make it appropriate for Disney Plus? Or do you consider it inappropriate censorship? We talked about this some more. And like I said, over 32, almost 3,300 of you guys have responded. One, two thirds of you, actually, that's a smaller number than I thought. Mm. I thought this would be like 90% to 10%. Really? To I really did. I really thought it'd be like 90% to 10%. Oh, but right now, 67.9% uh, of you feel like it's censorship. 32.1% of you uh, disagree with me or agree with me and think it's, it's perfectly okay. So it's about a two to one ratio on this. Again, I thought it was going to be much more lopsided. So I'm kind of surprised that it's as close as it is. Anyway, guys, I think there's a lot of nuance to this debate and there's a lot of interesting details to discuss. I think this is a fun discussion to have. What do you guys think about all this? Jump down into the comments section below and let us know your thoughts. I'm not going to lie. I really thought you were going to be angry. This is censorship. You thing. did? As, what? A, as an artist, I really thought you were going to be. I, I was prepared for us to have this. Okay, great back here's and forth the thing. Here's the thing. 
if the if the if the U.S. government mandated no more butts, yeah. no more nipples, no more you can't do nudity because that's inappropriate for American viewing, like there like happens in other countries. Right. You know, there are other countries where there is massive censorship. I mean, my cousin who was living in Abu Dhabi said, um, "I just saw bitch slap on television," and I said, "In Abu Dhabi, in Abu Dhabi," and I go. What did you see like 30 seconds of the movie? The whole movie is like cleavage and guns and violence and sexuality. And she's like, yeah, it was definitely a very edited version. Like you can't even if the government was saying these are things that you cannot show in movies or in television anywhere because we feel like we need to police what people are watching. That 100 percent I would have an issue with. But this it's like just like you use the analogy of a, of a remake or a sequel. The original is still available. Daryl Hannah's butt will live on for all of us to enjoy in perpetuity. But you know what? If you're going to watch Disney Plus, you just got to be ready to watch it through the eyes of a four year old. And how many of the people that vote that were really up in arms about this are going to cancel their Disney Plus subscriptions because of it? Oh, oh, none. None. Exactly. But that's okay. You can have a problem with one thing and not cancel your membership. I mean, that's all right. But no, anyway. I'm mad, John. God damn it. <laughs> Question for you guys is, what do you feel about this? Jump down to the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys. With that down and out of the way, let's now move on to our main topics of the day. Although that was pretty much the main topic, too. But how do we select our main topics here on the John Campbell Show? Well, it's really rather simple. You see... You guys come up with them by going anytime, 24-7, over to www.thejohncampiashow.com slash contact. Once you guys get there, you're going to see a form. Fill it out with your topic or question. It's totally free. Hit submit, and then maybe, just maybe, you might see your submission featured as a main topic here on The John Campia Show. With that down, let's move on to main topic number one. And our first main topic today gets submitted to us by Terence Mercelli, who writes, Greetings, John. I know you've been talking about the Josh Trank movie with Tom Hardy Fonzo for years now, and I was wondering if you had a chance to see the trailer that dropped, and it's apparently coming out on May 12th via, uh, via VOD, which is okay because I thought it was never going to get released at all. What did you think of the trailer. All right, thanks a lot for sending that in, man. And yes, this Josh Trank movie uh, that was called Fonzo, now called Capone, which quite frankly is a much better title. It, it is a much, much, <laughs> much better title. I understood the Fonzo reference, but this, for marketing purposes, this is a much better title. Anyway, Josh Trank, of course, the director who did the incredible movie Chronicle, uh, which I just absolutely love, and who very infamously got done very dirty by Fox when it came to Fantastic Four that he did, and we could, we could talk about that ad nauseum for hours, but he's now back, and he made this movie years ago. I mean, we've been talking about this movie for years, years, and I honestly, I think somebody asked a question about it a little while ago, and I, I said, actually, you know what? I, I don't know that this is ever going to come out. Mm. I don't know this movie's ever going to happen, but guess what? They dropped the trailer. It's out. Now, for those of you who don't know much about it, here's the thing. This is from Variety. Tom Hardy is playing an aging and sickly Al Capone in a trailer for the upcoming uh, retitled Capone biopic about America's most notorious gangster. Director Josh Trank released the trailer and the first footage on his Twitter account Wednesday with a May 12th release date. The official synopsis reads, the 47-year-old Al Capone, after 10 years in prison, starts suffering from dementia and comes to be haunted by his violent past. And yep, they put this thing out. And I'll tell you what, there were a few things I knew going into this thing. Number one, I knew it was a much lower budget project. This wasn't like Marty Scorsese wants $200 million to make the next drama he's doing, which I have Whoa. no idea why. This was much, much lower. This is just like guerrilla filmmaking. It was a much lower budget project. Great. It had an incredible lead actor in it, in a Tom Hardy, who, of course, we all love. And it was being directed by Josh Trank. And I've been really looking forward to seeing Josh get back in the director's chair again uh, to see what he can do. I mean, obviously, the Fantastic Four situation, he got done dirty by, by Fox. So I've been really waiting to see, okay, was Chronicle a one-hit wonder, or can we really see what he can follow up with? And I've been very, very excited to see that. And I'll tell you what, I watched this trailer. I thought the trailer was great. I, I loved it. Now, granted, I approached it with the understanding that this is a lower budget thing and all that kind of stuff. But the tell you got Matt Dillon in there who looks fantastic in it. You got Tom Hardy playing this role, which I think he's going to be great in it. 
I saw the trailer. I I thought it looked great. And yeah, it's going to come out straight to VOD, which is kind of unfortunate. But again, I was like you who wrote in the question. I thought this movie was now doomed and was never going to see a screen at all. And I love the fact that we're going to get a chance to see it. So I liked it very much. Aaron, you had a chance to watch this trailer for Capone. I know you haven't had a lot of exposure to... to we, you haven't been a part of a lot of the discussions we've had about this movie. We but, talked about it, though. Because oh, when, I, when, I, when I saw Fonzo, I was like, oh, yeah, okay. We talked about that a long oh, time it was ago. ages ago. And what can you remind us what the Fonzo name was about? Like what the, what the, uh, it, was, it was a nickname regarding Capone, for, from what I understand. But this okay. makes much more sense. Much, more, everybody, much everybody better for marketing. It. Yeah. What did you think about the trailer? I loved it i loved it i loved it i loved it first of all i love a mobster movie in general i mean if i watched goodfellas every single day i it i would be thrilled goodfellas and a cheeseburger every single day those are the things that i could live on and this trailer it gives me everything it gives me the 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 killing and the sexiness um and the flashbacks of the younger time but also the older tony soprano hand wringing gut-wrenching soul-searching conflicted personality but then also some of these flashbacks in the just in a split second of a shot I'm wondering, oh my gosh, is that actually a flashback or is that a demented version or a haunted memory that wasn't actually real? Uh, the fact that he is exploring Al Capone's dementia, not just the fact that he's aging and he's thinking back over his past mistakes, but the fact that he is actually, you know, that, that he's actually deteriorating. And it'll be fascinating to see how that is explored and portrayed you know my first inclination when i before i even started seeing the trailer but when i saw the side by side of the photo of al capone and the side and the photo of uh, an aging tom hardy you know tom hardy is disturbingly attractive <laughs> i've never thought about it in those terms but i'll go with it disturbingly like Tom and I have a, uh, we have a thing of there's no. Tom, your husband, not Tom. Yeah, Hardy. sorry. Tom, my husband, and I have a rule that there's no hall passes because we tried to have that conversation early in our marriage. He was like, so who would be your hall pass? And I said, actors can't have hall passes because if I said, oh, my hall, like he, his hall pass before was like Gina Gershon. And then he ended up doing a reading with Gina Gershon. And then like, um, so so you can't ever have that because you may actually meet that person. And then, you know, what are you gonna do? Um, I'm like, sorry, Tom. So Tom Hardy, if there were hall passes in the world, it would be Tom Hardy. And so my feeling always is, is he too handsome to play this? <laughs> but he's such an insanely talented actor. I mean, if if you've seen Bronson. Oh yeah, he's so good in that. It is one of the most remarkable Tom Hardy performances, and he physically transforms in such a way. And even in this trailer, like I was convinced, I said, okay, Tom Hardy can be as ugly as Al Capone. He has this masterful way of manipulating his face, and uh, he is someone who has really transcended um, a lot of the Hollywood hysteria and BS and really gone straight to hard, deep roles that are just beautifully crafted. And I'm so excited to see this. Yeah, I, I think it looks great as well. Question here for you guys. Have you had a chance to check out the trailer for Capone? If so, what did you think? Jump on down to the comments section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, with that down, let's move on to main topic number two. And our second main topic today gets submitted to us by Ashley M who writes, John, you mentioned we could see Joss Whedon back in the MCU to direct. With rumors of John Krasinski as Mr. Fantastic and Peyton Reed doing Ant-Man 3, do you think Whedon might be the one to direct the Fantastic Four movie? Thanks for all your hard work. All right, thanks a lot for sending that in, Ashley. And yeah, very a lot of people very excited about Fantastic Four, like a, that we've been, speaking of Josh Trank, that we have been excited about time and time again, and time and time again, for various reasons, we have been disappointed. But we are very excited about this again. Yesterday, we talked about how John Krasinski seemed to tease the audience a little bit. Everybody wants to see him and his incredible wife as Reed Richards and as Sue Storm. Everybody wants to see it, all that kind of stuff. But one thing that's been kind of interesting here is, 
I have said before, and I still to this day, if, if I had to take my pick, and I don't like doing the which X director to direct X movie, but to me, there seems to be a common sense element to getting Peyton Reed to direct a Fantastic Four film. He was going to do one before. His sensibilities that he's shown with Ant-Man, I think, translate well. Not to mention, I think there's a slight chance they might even introduce Fantastic Four in Ant-Man 3. I don't know that. That's just me speculating as a fan. That being said, um, we've also talked a bunch about Joss Whedon in, uh, in, in the last year or so. Partially because... You know, after Ultron, which just kind of destroyed him, I mean, he was physically, mentally, emotionally just exhausted after all that. He walked away. I think there was some little bit of falling out between himself and uh, and Disney. You, know, you got to remember, too, Joss Whedon was Kevin Feige's guy. When Kevin Feige needed to have the first Avengers movie made, because I'll tell you right now, you may disagree with this, and that's fine. If that Avengers movie doesn't knock it out of the park, we do not have the MCU today that we have. Just that simple. Like, yeah, we had a good Iron Man movie, we had a really good Thor movie, we had a really good Captain America movie, but that thing of doing Avengers is something we had never seen before like that. And if that's not knocked out of the park, the MCU as we know it today would look very, very different. Joss Whedon stepped in there and crushed it and made what I still believe is the greatest comic book movie of all time. He was such a favorite of Kevin Feige. You have to remember this. That Kevin Feige, whenever Kevin Feige had any problems with any of his NC MCU movies, he would notoriously get Joss Whedon on the phone, said, I'm sending the Disney plane for you. They would fly in Joss Whedon to, on the spot, rewrite some pages of scenes to punch them up. Thor, The Dark World, which some people consider to be the worst MCU movie, every scene that's remotely redeemable and enjoyable about that was rewritten by Joss Whedon on the ground, on location, because Kevin Feige flew him in to do some emergency last-second rewrites. That's how much Kevin Feige relied on Joss Whedon. Then there was apparently some kind of a little bit of a falling out. And then what happened is, a few years passed, and all of a sudden, I started noticing at these various Disney events, like this one at Rogue One, Joss Whedon started showing up again. To all these big Disney events and he was there and then on the I believe it was the Infinity War it was either the Infinity War or the Endgame uh, Blu-ray and special features that they had this director's round table of all the very of a bunch not all but a bunch of various MCU directors and lo and behold Joss Whedon was there and all that kind of stuff and I've been saying for a while that I believe that at some point maybe sooner rather than later we're going to see Joss Whedon return to the MCU and direct another MCU movie I I have not made this a story before because I cannot, I don't even know how much confidence that I have that this is true. So let's just be very clear about that. But I have been told in the past two months that conversations with Joss Whedon regarding Fantastic Four have occurred. Again, I don't know if that was just conversations of, hey, let's, let's talk about this. Do you have any ideas? Hey, what would your take on this be? Casual or, Josh, we're really thinking about having you direct Fantastic Four. Would you even be interested? Because he's just been doing a lot of smaller stuff. And by the way, Josh Whedon's got a really interesting new series coming to HBO uh, called The Nevers uh, that he's working on. And I, I, the, the description of The Nevers sounds fantastic. Listen to this. An epic tale following a gang of Victorian women who <gasps> find themselves with unusual abilities, relentless enemies, and a mission that might change the world. And as soon as I hear that, I just think, well, that sounds like a Joss Whedon project. That sounds awesome. If, if, if I've ever heard of one. Mm -hmm. So he's got that that he's working on as well. Um, but I, I thought it would be interesting. Now, let, let me be clear here. My, if it was up to me. My first pick to direct Fantastic Four is still Peyton Reed. I just think Peyton Reed is an inspired choice to do it, but you can get anybody else and maybe it will end up being Joss Whedon. One thing that I hear though sometimes, and, and this to me is like one of the most mind boggling things I, I, I can possibly think of. There are people who don't like Justice League and that's fine. There are movies that I don't like and that's fine. There are people who don't like Justice League. I did enjoy Justice League, but I've uh, up until Harley Quinn, I've enjoyed all the DCU movies, uh, including obviously Man of Steel, which I love, uh, Batman versus Superman. I like Justice League. I mean, here's the thing, though. I think people really underestimate 
what Joss Whedon was able to accomplish with Justice League. What Joss Whedon did on Justice League is nothing short of absolutely Herculean because here's the situation that everybody just forgets about. Now, I know there are a bunch of Snyder Cut fans and blah, 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 anything that wasn't Snyder sucks. Okay, I get that. <laughs> but, and it's okay if you don't like Justice League. That's perfectly fine. There's movies I don't like. There's movies you don't like. It's all good. But I think what people fail to realize is that the Justice League circumstance was so unusual. Understand this. The Warner Brothers executives decided that the Justice League movie that Zack Snyder was making was not the movie they wanted. Agree or disagree, good or bad, that's perfectly fine. But the fact of the matter was, the movie that Zack Snyder was making was not the movie that Warner Brothers wanted. And maybe they were right or wrong to feel that way, but it is what they felt. So they turn to Joss Whedon and go, hey, Joss, you know this movie that was practically done, that was like 80% like done? Yeah, we want you to come in now. We want you to completely change it. You've got this amount of time to do it, and you have to make it fit in with everything else that we've already done, and you got no time. Go, 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 go. Do you realize how ridiculously impossible that is? Do you understand, and can we wrap our heads around, how unbelievably Titan-like it is to do that at all? And by the way, and we can agree or disagree and like it or not like it, that's fine. But he ended up making a movie that was better audience rating than Batman versus Superman was and had better critic rating than Batman versus Superman did. And it's a movie that has its issues, make no mistake about it. All I'm saying is you take almost any other director in Hollywood and you drop them in a situation like that, that movie's going to become an unmitigated disaster. An unmitigated disaster. So what Ron Howard did with Solo and what Joss Whedon was able to do with that, it's okay if you didn't like Justice League. It's okay because, I mean, it's a movie. We all have different opinions. If you didn't like it, you didn't like it. That's fine. But even if you didn't like it, you have to nod your head and say, yeah, that was a near impossible set of circumstances, though, that Joss Whedon walked into and he was asked to be a messiah of something and he had to do the best he could with a limited scope of freedom and limited time to try to remake something from scratch that the studio suddenly wanted different. And there are people who inappropriately blame. Guess what? It wasn't J Joss Whedon's fault that it didn't turn out to be the Zack Snyder cut. It was WB who didn't want the Zack Snyder cut. They didn't want it. And if it wasn't Joss Whedon, it was going to be another director. And I'm going to tell you what, it's a 99% chance, maybe 98% chance that if it was any other director other than Joss Whedon, man, that movie would have turned out worse. And I think that even if you don't like that cut of the movie, you have to take a knee and say, hey, dude, poof, what you pulled off, given the circumstances, is damn impressive. It's damn impressive. So listen. If they announce that Joss Whedon is directing a Fantastic Four movie tomorrow, I'm all for it. It fits his sensibilities. I would still rather see Peyton Reed. There might even be a couple of other directors I would rather see in front of Joss Whedon on that line, but he's one of those directors that if he was going to do it, I would be all for it. So anyway, that's my take on it right now. Aaron, <laughs> as somebody who's, you've worked, you've acted in Joss Whedon-related properties, um, and, and you know, you know, when you're looking at big projects like this, what would you think of a Joss Whedon directing a Fantastic Four? Or are you are you like me? Would you rather see Peyton Reed? Would you rather see John Krasinski himself direct it? Where, what are your thoughts on this right now? Okay, well, since you brought it up, I'm just gonna tell a quick little story about the first. So I, I did a couple episodes of Dollhouse many, many years ago. Um, and that was how I ended up meeting Stephen tonight. And that, you know, ended up moving into Getting Spartacus. Getting on Spartacus, yeah. Right. Um, so I knew who Joss Whedon, I knew who he was, but I, I'd never, met him and I didn't know what he looked like, um, even though I had met him multiple times at Comic-Con apparently. And so I was about to walk in, you know, whenever you're on a lot and you're going into a stage, there's always two doors. You open the first door and then you're in a little room and then there's a second door. Um, it's just so that, you, you know, you don't walk in while they're in the middle of a take. And so I walked in and I was waiting in the little room and then this guy walked in and he went to walk into the main stage and the light was on and I said, oh no, 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 the, they're, they're rolling. And informed this person in a very nice way, but um, he kind of looked at me and he just goes, oh, okay, sure, okay. And he waited. And then afterwards I realized that, that was Joss Whedon and that was the show that he was the executive producer of and I felt like a 
big asshole and a complete idiot. Uh, so I was like, okay, don't ever tell someone they're rolling because they're probably going to be the executive producer and they know what that red light means. Anyway, um, I think that this is a great opportunity for us to see Joss Whedon back in the driver's seat of a big fi a, a, a big film like this. And you're right. It is a an incredibly challenging position for anyone to be put into when they're taking over a role for someone, whether it's as the director or someone taking over an actual role for a previous actor that had played that. You know, they're always going to be coming under the shadow of the previous person, Zack Snyder, in this situation. And fans continuing to say, well, what would it have been like? Well, what would have, you know, could it have been better? Could it have been worse? We don't, we'll never know about that. Um, I also like the fact that he's been quietly kind of sneaking back into the scene. You know, we've all had relationships, whether they be romantic or with family or friends or business that go sour and that somehow end up building themselves back into, you know, a positive relationship and I like the fact that this relationship has been one where instead of just saying okay after this big break we're now just going to commit to this big film together Joss Whedon has slowly been like all right you know what I'm going to show up at this event I'm going to make sure that there's no drama there's no craziness okay I'll you know help out with this little project he's been slowly inching his way back in there to make sure that the waters are clean and fresh and smooth and uh, and so I think now him jumping into a directorial position with a big feature like Fantastic Four is a great idea and I'm excited to watch it also very excited about this show the nevers that sounds yeah, great. I, I think that sounds actually really really interesting yeah. um, again what I what I want to make sure I'm very clear about here is this like again going back to the Justice League situation with Joss Whedon I believe he saved that film now, that doesn't mean he made it a great film that you needed to like it and all that kind of stuff not at all maybe you thought it was a poor film and it's it's cool it's fine to think it was a poor film I certainly think the film has its problems but again if you go understanding the circumstances, he didn't pull the plug on Zack Snyder's Justice right. League. Warner Brothers did. And then they turned to Joss Whedon and said, huh, hey, you practically have to do this whole thing from start, but make it fit in with all the other stuff was there. And oh, by the way, you've only got this much time. And oh, by the way, you've only got this much budget. And mm -hmm. go. Listen, this movie ended up having a higher critic rating and a higher audience rating. The audience rating on Batman versus Superman was something like 63 or 64%. The audience rating on Justice League was 71%. Not that not that you should really rely on audience ratings because they can be very just mis misleading. I, I agree with that. But the critic rating was also significantly higher, even though it was still not a good critic rating. So again, all I'm saying is, I think Joss Whedon saved that movie from being an even bigger disaster. Like it was a movie that still ended up breaking even, could have lost them hundreds of million dollars. It's a movie that more of the audience liked than the previous one. Maybe that's fair or not fair, but all I'm saying is it's okay if you don't like it, but even as somebody who doesn't like that movie, and even as somebody who doesn't like that Warner Brothers removed Zack Snyder from the film, and even you can be all those things and still acknowledge, wow, not many directors could have stepped in and done with Justice League under those circumstances what Joss Whedon was able to do. And I think it could have turned out when you look at how much of a train wreck that whole situation was, I think you got to acknowledge that is a movie that could have gone worse a million different ways. And that's why I, when I make the statement, I'm, when I say Joss Whedon saved, um, saved Justice League, people think that means I'm saying he made it the greatest movie of all time. No, no, he didn't. But man, it could have been a hell of a lot worse. And that's kind of my feelings on it. But anyway, guys, I'm sure a lot of you have a lot of very different feelings on that. Jump down into the comments section below and let me know your thoughts. All right. Two more topics to go here, guys. So let's move on to main topic number three. And our third main topic today gets submitted to us by Geeky Gator, who writes, Hey, John and gang, Parasite debuted on Hulu on April 8th and in just one week became the second most viewed movie on the streaming service, beating the lights of Transformers 5, Creed 2, A Quiet Place, and more. This seems extremely impressive to me and could possibly open the door for more foreign films. What do you think? All right, thanks a lot for sending that in, man. And of course, yeah, Best Picture winner, Parasite, now on Hulu, and it's making a killing on Hulu. It's doing great on Hulu for the streaming service. Of course, in reference to what was in the email, this comes to us from IndieWire. Even more impressive, Parasite is now the second most watched movie overall on Hulu ever among titles currently available to stream. 
What that means is that in one week, Parasite outstreamed the lifetimes of popular titles such as How to Train Your Dragon, The Hidden World, A Quiet Place, Transformers The Last Night, and Creed 2, all of which have been available to stream on Hulu for several months. All right. I am shocked. I'm shocked at this figure. I really am. Not because I don't think that Parasite isn't brilliant. It is brilliant. It's a marvelous film. The way I describe, you guys have heard me describe it like this before. I describe Parasite as, imagine Dirty Rotten Scoundrels directed by Quentin Tarantino. That's... <laughs> That's what Parasite is. It's basically that. And I love every twist and turn of this movie, and it's amazing. But even as somebody who loved this film, I'll tell you what. I didn't expect a whole throng of people to be clamoring to watch it on streaming. It's just not a mass popular kind of film. It's just not that kind of film. So I really wasn't expecting it. So to see so many people rushing to see it and setting these types of marks, I got to tell you what, for me is very encouraging. I, I think that's very encouraging stuff to see, and, and I think that's great. So good on Hulu. Now, understand, too, Hulu isn't Netflix. Hulu doesn't have the same type of traffic that, say, even Disney Plus does, or definitely certainly not the type of traffic that Netflix has. But still, to pull off those types of numbers, I think is very impressive. And Aaron, I'll tell you what else. I think it's very deserving because this mm -hmm. movie is brilliant. Of course, it won Best Picture. As far as the question, though, when they ask, do I think this can open the door for more foreign film? Honestly, I don't think this is an issue of it being a foreign film. So I don't right. think it hurts or helps it, to be honest, in terms of it being a foreign film. I just think this is a great movie that won Best Picture at the Academy Awards. What it might do, though, is if some people check this out, because a lot of people don't like watching subtitled movies and stuff like that. It's just not their preference, which is totally cool. But I think it, what it might do is make some people who aren't really, you know, foreign films aren't their jam. Mm-hmm. It might open a few people up to some more movies for themselves, although I don't know if it's going to make a big difference as far as, you know, streaming numbers and things like that. But anyway, Aaron, you hear these statistics and these figures. What do you think about it? I'm actually, I'm not surprised. And here's why. When Parasite first came out in theaters, uh, it was a big ask for American audiences specifically to go to the movie theater. We've talked ad nauseum about the cost of going to a physical uh, you know, brick and mortar movie theater. And so to ask Americans, A, to go see a movie with um, that is a foreign film that is in a foreign language and is going to require them to pay attention and read, you've already lost like 50% of America with right no there. With no actors they recognize. With no actors that they recognize, despite the fact that they are very well-known Korean actors in Korea and in Asia. Um, and then on top of all of that, you say, well, what's the movie about? Well, we can't really tell you. Because if we tell you what the movie is about, then it'll spoil the whole movie, essentially. Because I asked many people, what is Parasite about? And they said, I'm not going to say what it's about. You just have to watch it's it. It's difficult to say what it's about. I mean, it's how, it's almost hard to define. Well, it's. I mean, I, I think it's just a story about class warfare. Well, that's part of it. I, I see, mean, yeah. that, well, that's what I see. But, you know, obviously there's many, many layers of what the film is. And the film is also, I think, a Different, it means different things to different people depending on the lens through which you are watching it. But so, so I think that the fact that it is doing very well on streaming is not surprising because people who may have been like, I don't necessarily know if I want to pay $23 a ticket plus parking plus popcorn plus whatever. I don't necessarily know if I want to invest in that while it's in the theaters, especially during a time which as we have established, 2019 was a killer year yeah, for movies. Yeah. There were so many amazing films to choose from. And someone may have said, well, I'd rather go watch Knives Out or, you know. But once it had, it got not only best picture, also best director. You know, you saw the entire cast. It did really well at the Golden Globes as well. You saw all these people get so excited about this film. And it was really the most talked about film of 2019 that was not a blockbuster. Um, there was a lot of enthusiasm over it. And also, it is a film that when you watch it once, you want to go back and watch it again. Yeah. So I think that this is these numbers are also reflecting repeat viewing. Where And, and um, movies like Creed, Transformers, A Quiet Place, those are great movies to see in a theater. You want to see... Not so much Transformers. Eh, I'm just going to say that. No, really? 
Oh, I hated that movie. Well, no, I I don't mean I don't mean like the quality of the movie. Oh, the, the I just kind mean of movie. The yeah, kind the, yeah, of movie. I agree with that, yeah. You want to watch a big budget action feature or a horror film like you want to be scared with everybody yeah you know th so a quiet place makes sense that it would do really well in theaters you i don't want to watch horror films in my house because i'm that I'll, I'll have to like burn the house down so i don't watch them in my house i watch them in a the theater and i can ha i can go okay the theater is haunted my house is a safe zone um but i would have to move if i watched a horror movie in my house so i understand why movies like creed and transformers and quiet place would do really well in theaters and maybe not it's like okay i've seen it i don't necessarily need to watch it at home but parasite absolutely that's one for watch it once watch it again, watch it a third time, and I think it's fantastic and good for all of them. Yeah, it's it, it's good to see, and I think it's very, like I said, I'm surprised, but pleasantly surprised. It's good to see. Question is, guys, what do you think about these numbers? I think it's really impressive. How do you feel about them? Jump into the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys, with that down, let's move into our fourth and final main topic today. And our fourth and final main topic today gets submitted to us by Jose, who writes, Huge fan of the show. Thank you so much. I was wondering if the new Halloween sequel will break Venom's record uh, of opening weekend in October. I feel like it has a pretty good chance, given how popular 2018's Halloween was. What are your thoughts? Thanks. All right. Thanks a lot for sending that in, man. And yeah. We're supposed to be getting this new Halloween film. And listen, a little bit of background on this. I don't like the Halloween movies. <gasps> I know. I'm one of the, I, like, that's what one of the films that people look at me. I, I don't even think the original Halloween holds up very well. I, I'm like, meh, I, whatever. But the Jamie Lee Curtis one they just did. I was skeptical I would enjoy it. I really liked it. It's the first Halloween film that I personally, like, really, really enjoyed. And I've been excited about a new one. Now, of course, it's supposed to come out in October, and right now there's no reason to believe it won't hit its release date at this point. That could change for now. I think it's pretty, I, I think you're you're on pretty solid ground to, to think it's going to come out on its release date, and I think we're, we're pretty good there. Could it break the opening weekend October record? Now, the first thing I need to do is correct you a little bit, though, Jose, is that Venom that did hold the opening weekend box office record for October. It did. It no longer holds the opening weekend box office record for October. That honor now goes to Joker. Joker is actually the opening weekend box office king. We're making $96.2 million on its opening weekend. Venom, of course, was the record holder at 80.2. Halloween, the last one was 76. Uh, Gravity made 55 million, and The Martian at one point made 54 million. Now, of course, it's important to note here that Halloween opened with $76 million. And that movie was beloved. People really dug that film, and I am definitely one of those that really dug the film. And so there's a couple of different ways to look at this. Could a Halloween, a new sequel, given the popularity of the first one, come out, make $20 more million, and beat the Joker opening weekend record? I'm going to say there's two different answers to that question. On a totally level playing field, yeah, I think this Halloween sequel could open to more than $96 million. I really do. I'm not saying a guarantee would. Don't don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying it's a 100% guarantee that it would do it. But in the world of legitimate possibilities, considering how much that first one made at $76 million, and considering how popular it was with people, and there seems to be a real legitimate excitement for the next one, I think on an even playing field, yeah, I do. I wouldn't think you're crazy at all to think that this one could overtake Joker. I don't think it'll make as much movie as Joker did overall. Like I don't, th I don't see this Halloween movie joining the Billion Dollar Club. I don't think many of you do. But could it beat 96 million on an opening weekend? Yeah, I think it could. Okay, that's the even playing field kind of look at it. But now let's look at it under the given circumstances, and we've had to be doing that a little bit lately. Because right now, of course, the world is not an even playing field. And while I really do believe theaters are definitely going to be open again by October and all that kind of stuff, are things going to be really back to full normal by October? I don't know. Because even though the theaters are going to be open, I still think that there's going to be a lot of people that are going to rush back to the movie theaters. I really do believe. I think there's going to be a lot of people that are just looking to get back to living life the way they normally live it. But at the same time, I also believe there's going to be a lot of people who are going to be a little bit more cautious. 
and who might be a little slower to get back out into the movie theaters. And maybe by October, not everybody does. And that changes the question a little bit. So I'm going to say this. This is my prediction from now, but I'm not willing to put money on either side of this. I think under normal circumstances, yes, this Halloween movie could theoretically beat that Joker record. Not overall, but opening weekend, yes. But given the circumstances we're in, I think that's getting 20 more million than that first one made. I think that's a little bit of a tall order, given the fact that we're going to have a good section, uh, Aaron, of our movie going public that's not quite ready to maybe rush back out at that point. So while I think the new Halloween movie is going to do very well, I don't see it, given the current circumstances, I don't see it beating that Joker record. What do you think? Well, I'm really excited about this. And uh, as I've already established, I only watch horror movies in theaters, so I don't have to burn my house down. And I loved ho Halloween. I absolutely thought it was fantastic. I was thrilled to see Jamie Lee Curtis back. I thought she did a phenomenal job. And the conflict that she had with her daughter, played by Judy Greer, and then her granddaughter, played by Andy Matichek, I believe is how you pronounce her name. Um, I thought that those three women did a fantastic job of leading this film and really giving us all of the conflict that you would see in a family um, I'm curious to see how that family dynamic plays out now that mom has I mean, grandma has established that she's not totally nuts and actually her um, all of her pre-planning was for good reason and not for not um, so I'm curious about what the story is going to be that being said I think that it all depends like you were saying John on the timing of when theaters do open back up I think audiences are going to need at least three months of open theaters with no major problems to feel comfortable. So if theaters are opening, you know, worst case scenario, well, not worst case scenario, but let's just say hypothetically that they open July 1st. And for July, August, and September, we had no problems, no cases, no people getting sick, blah, blah, blah. Then I, yeah, I think that by the time October 1st rolls around, audiences will feel a lot more comfortable. You know, if we don't have theaters opening back up until September, it's going to be really, really mm, bad. Yeah. We also don't know what's going to be opening at that same time. You know, we, one could make the argument, oh, well, there's been, you know, productions have been halted, so there may not be movies available. But at the same time, all the movies that were supposed to open that didn't are going to be pushed. And they're going to need, as we've talked about, the time for advertising and marketing and all the things. So it's really going to depend on what else is coming out, how much time people have gotten to acclimate to feeling safe and comfortable going back to the movie theater. Um, and, and and I think between those two things, we'll really get a, a, a better gauge. I think that we'll know more in August of you know how Halloween is going to do because we'll have a really clear idea of what other films are coming out and whether or not people are going to the movies. But I can say I, for one, really hope that things uh, that, that are new normal, because we'll never go back to what our old normal was, just doesn't work that way that our new normal i hope that uh i i hope to be their opening weekend because i'm really excited about this film yeah now i've ha i've heard some discussions with people who go i've had i've had some discussions last night with a friend of mine it's like yeah you know one of the topics because you know friends ask me all the time it's oh, so what are your topics tomorrow and i talked about this mm -hmm. one it's like oh well, halloween can never be joker it's like how much money do you think joker made on opening weekend Oh, didn't it didn't make like 160 because remember Joker ultimately made like a billion dollars, right? So, right, and so that's what people have in their mind. That's what people but have no, in their mind. I, so I, they think it made like 150, 160 million opening weekend. Actually, it didn't. It made 96, which is great, but beatable. That that is a 96 yeah. is a beatable number. And then the word of mouth really carried it, right? Especially when you're talking about a movie that the last one that came out with the word of mouth mm -hmm. made 76 million. This little thing, this little horror movie. Made seventy six million on his first one. If you don't think ninety six million is a beatable number under those circumstances, you're crazy. Of course, right. it's a beatable number. But again, a lot of people just hear Joker. It's a billion dollar film. It had like a two hundred million dollar opening. No, it's it's actually it just really rolled. Mm -hmm. Joker rolled because it's so damn good. I mean, it just rolled and rolled and rolled and rolled. Got this huge number, and I don't think there's any chance that Halloween beats its overall. Right. I don't think anybody really thinks that. But opening weekend, yeah, you better believe that 96 is a theoretically beatable number. I just don't think with the current circumstances that it might do it. But maybe you guys feel differently. What do you think about all that? Jump down into the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. 
Okay, guys, with all that down and out of the way, we're going to move on here in just a second to take your live questions. Remember, there are two different ways of sending live questions. One, the main way to use it, and the best way to use it, is to use this tip link, which you can see in the top of the description of this video below. You can just see the link there. It is, of course, streamelements.com slash movieblogtv slash tip. You'll be supporting the channel, and you get your question right on, on air. But also, you can just use the Super Chat feature here on YouTube if you wish. But before we do that, as we do every day, we're going to take just a couple of minutes now, rest the vocal cords, stretch our legs, refill the drink, give you a chance to run and use the bathroom, all that kind of stuff. And I'm sure we're going to have a lot of discussion about some of the topics we've already talked about here today that you guys are going to bring up. So hang tight, guys. Don't go anywhere. We will be right back. Thank you guys for your patience and indulgence as we took a little bit of a break there and now let's dive into it and start taking your questions and we're going to start things off here with where are we at nks432 writes cinemark stock is down from the mid 30s to the tens no amc like debt would you buy shares now for triple digit returns once business restarts here's the thing i'm looking more at amc stock because amc stock got down as low as two dollars and eight cents Woo! and then when wanda came out yesterday and said now nah, we're the, the those things about but AMC going bankrupt or rumor 
all of a sudden it jumped up to $2.40. Now that may not sound like a lot, but if I had the other day, like I was planning on it, if I had bought a thousand shares, like I was planning on, I would have made 300 bucks overnight. I would have made $300 overnight on that. So um, I'm a little bit more into that sort of an idea. So I, I'd, I'd be tempted. I, I don't expect that it's just going to go back up to the level that it was at before. But yeah, it could be. You could see a nice return a little bit. But then again, don't listen to me about financial advice. I'm not a financial advisor by any, any shape or means. But it's something I'm looking at doing myself. All right, Preston Bell writes, John, just trying to remember the name of that Star Wars book you like so much about a couple that lived during the time of the original trilogy. Sounds like a good read. Thanks and stay safe. It is a wonderful read. It is called Lost Stars. It's written by uh, an author by the name of Claudia Gray. It is absolutely fantastic. And basically, it's about this these two people, this young guy and this young girl, who start as basically children, and it goes through the story of the original trilogy, but from their point of view. And one of them ends up in the Empire, one of them ends up in the Rebellion, but they always maintain their connection. And it just tells the Star Wars story from a different point of view. I'm telling you what, it was refreshing, it was original. I loved it. Has Tom, does Tom read like Star Wars novels at all? Well, he's going to because that is going to be his next present. I tell you, Lost Stars is wonderful. I'm going to get it for him. I think that he would love it. it it's it's great. Or get him the audio book or whatever. But it's it, the audio books are great because the Star Wars audio books, like they make them full radio productions, like mm -hmm. with music and sound effects. But yeah, it's called Lost Stars. Uh, definitely, I highly recommend it. Uh, NKS writes, uh, Darkest Harry Potter, Half-Blood Prince or Deathly Hollows? Well, I, I personally, I, look, I'm not a Potter head, but I say Deathly Hollows. I, I thought that. Were you much of a Potter person? I read the first uh, three books, but I never, I never got into the movies. Not that I didn't like them. I just never got into them. Yeah, I'm not a major Potter head, but for me, I would say... Uh, I would say Deathly Hollows. All right, Elijah Anderson writes, okay, so no July release for Tenant. I don't think so, but you never know. Um, do you think August, September, or October would give WB enough time to ramp up a marketing? Stay safe. It all depends on if they know they're going to get. See, that's the problem here. It's hard to set a date and then it's hard to know when to start remarketing when you still don't know when the theaters are going to be open. Because that's mm -hmm. we're talking about tens of millions, sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars that you're spending on these marketing campaigns. If they feel confident that, yeah, theaters are going to be open again in July, uh, we can move it from July to September, we can start a big marketing campaign in June, that gives them enough time, sure, but it all comes down to them finding out. But in theory, in theory, if all the blocks fall into the right places, and that's a big if, it could happen. It could happen. C.E. Nelson writes, watch Tombstone for the first time over the weekend. I do not understand how in the world Val, Val Kilmer did not uh, at least get nominated for an Oscar that year. Your thoughts? Well, okay, I think this. Um, that was great, but and Val Kilmer was wonderful, but... Who do you replace out of this list? Who do you replace out of this list? First of all, Tommy Lee Jones, I believe, won the Academy Award that year uh, for his portrayal in The Fugitive. He wasn't going to knock out Tommy Lee Jones out of that. And actually, let me bring up the list here because I know, hold on a second, I know Ray Fiennes was also, hold on a second, was also nominated that year. So was John Malkovich. So hold on a second, let me just bring up the full list here. Hold on a second, hold on a second. Okay, here we go. Here were the nominees. Who do you bump off this list? And I love Val Kimmer and Tombstone, but who do you bump off? Tommy Lee Jones for Fugitive? No, you, you, no, you don't. Leonardo DiCaprio for What's Eating Gilbert Grape? No. No, some people think that might even be his best performance yep. ever. Um, Ray Fiennes from Schindler's List? Oh. I don't think so. Um, John Malkovich for In the Line of Fire? Mm. Malkovich was amazing in that and i always think of this guy from uh mr oh what's his name in usual suspects it's uh uh kobayashi i think it's mr kobayashi uh pete i always mispronounce his last name post uh from in the name of the father which some people thought he actually maybe even should have won that year so that's the thing about the oscars aaron it's not about that did you do great right. it's about did you do great and better than everybody else and you have to look at the other nominees <sighs> And, and honestly, I love Val Kilmer in Tombstone. Who doesn't? But I don't see anybody on that list I would bump out. Right. 
for for him like would you i mean i don't know how do you see it no but you know what i um i i i envy you for seeing tombstone for the first time tombstone is such a phenomenal movie and i love that you zeroed in on val kilmer's performance because there's a lot of great performances in that movie uh it, it is definitely a classic and yeah val kilmer did a fantastic job Val Kilmer's a wonderful actor. I like Val Kilmer a lot. I do too. Yeah. Um, okay, let's move on here. Uh, Samir Tesfai writes, uh, bought some stocks and playing the long game, baby. AMC, mm -hmm. don't call it a comeback. I've been here for years. I'm rocking my peers, putting suckers and fears, a little bit of LL <laughs> in there, up there. With the, uh, we, with the ha oh, classic LL. Ah. My first sex dream was about LL Cool J. No. Yeah. Really? We were, yeah, we were in China, and then I, I met him for the first Wait a time. Wait you were in China, or the dream was you the were in China? The dream was based okay. in China, and I was with LL Cool J, and uh, yes, it was my first sex dream. And then I ended up having, I met him, I had to get him to sign something. I was working for a producer, and I think that he could see the thought bubble above my head because I kind of like I looked at him and I turned 17 shades of red and he just gave me this look like yeah girl I know what you're thinking it was very embarrassing oh uh, LL I remember uh, ladies love cool James I listen a lot of people a lot of people when they think of LL they'll think of you know that you know the don't call a comeback mama said knock you out you know all I that think kind of round stuff. the way girl I think Rock the Bells. Oh, that's a good one too. I, yeah. like, Rock the Bells is the bum 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 bum. I just mm -hmm. is I oh I don't yeah. know. I, okay, I'm I'm in the real danger here, going off on a big major <laughs> LL Cool J sidetrack here. Anyway, good idea. I've been thinking the same thing, Samir. All Did right, you next. used to break dance to LL Cool J? Oh yes, particularly to Rock the Bells. Again, yeah. I am offering anyone out there Doesn't who knows exist. John from back in his break dancing days, name your price. Name your exist. price. Let me know. And because here's the thing. I want that video. What everybody forgets about is that that was in an era when people, I don't have my phone here, when not everybody walked around with a global audiovisual telecommunications device. Like if you wanted a camera, you had to get the big But VHS somebody's thing. got that. You know, somebody's got I that. Have, I have some footage. I have some film. If but it's, you have it, someone else has it. Release the breakdance cut. Never gonna happen. Okay, anyway, next up. Uh, Jerry Lung uh, sends in like a $50 tip. Thank you so much for that, Jerry, for supporting the channel on that level, man. We appreciate that. Um, interest on Anime Renew as JJ will do us a version of your name. Uh, WB by rights of Attack on Titan. Your name was acclaimed. Episodes of Attack on Titan were in the top three IMDb ranking. Uh, just behind uh, Breaking Bad. Can they ever be good or just be like video game movies? Well, I mean, here's the thing. Your name is one that got a lot of attention. And it's important to understand that JJ Abrams is not actually directing that. He, his production company, Bad Robot, is going to be making a, a version of it. And they've brought on Mark Webb, who did 500 Days of Summer and did a great job on the first uh, Amazing Spider-Man. Mm, Amazing Spider-Man 2 took a no nosedive, but whatever. Mark and he Webb did the pilot of Limitless. Oh, did Mark Webb do the pilot of Limitless? Mm -hmm. I did not know that, yeah. which, of course, your husband, Tom, was was a cast member on. Um, I didn't I didn't realize that. Um it all depends. Look, look, as much as anime fans think that in North America it's so popular, it's really not. And that's kind of unfair. And I think it really depends. If one thing can really break through, um, then maybe. But it's going to be a challenge. It's just, it's going to be a challenge. And, uh, and we'll see what happens. But hey, listen, hope springs eternal. And listen, Jerry, uh, since you did send in $50, not only are we answering the question now, we're going to answer your question in its own standalone short video that we're going to put up on the YouTube channel in the next couple of weeks. Keep your eyes open for that. Thank you for sending that in and thank you for the support, man. And we'll go a little bit more in depth of that when we do its own standalone video. So thank you for that. All right, next up, Kenneth231 uh, writes, Hey, John, first time tipping. Thank you so much, man. We appreciate that. In order... Uh, from keeping myself from losing my mind, I began to watch series of films on based on specific directors each week. I've had a couple of people actually write mm. in and saying they're doing that. Last week was Bay, Michael Bay, I guess. This week is Christopher Nolan. Any recommendations from Christopher Nolan films? Oh, with Christopher Nolan, it's just about anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, the one I recommend, though, because it's actually my favorite Christopher Nolan film, is a film that this and this is the Christopher Nolan film most people haven't seen even though it's got Al Pacino and it's got um, uh, uh, Robin Williams and it's got two-time Academy Award winner um, Hilary Swank and all kind of stuff. It's a movie called Insomnia. 
And I freaking love this movie. I, I It's my personal favorite Christopher Nolan film. Mm-hmm. So you got Insomnia. Obviously, you got Dark Knight. So that goes without saying. Uh, I'd say go back to the one that put him on the map for a lot of people, which is Memento. Uh, everybody <laughs> loves... Um, um, well, not everybody loves Interstellar, but um, Inception, Inception mm-hmm. uh, is, is definitely one everybody loves. And I would say also, I mean, you can't go wrong with any of them, but I would also say uh, The Prestige. Even though I'm not a big fan of the ending of Prestige, I still love that movie. If you had to like give your top two Nolan films that you think Memento people should and say, Inception, no question. Oh yeah, so I that haven't was seen just Insom- quick and easy. I haven't seen Insomnia though. I love it. I love Memento, and it's also one of those movies that because of its convoluted and complicated storyline, you can watch it one time and then immediately you want to watch it again to go back knowing what you knew then um, and watch the movie a- a- again and again. It's really a- and a brilliant performance by. I'm blanking. Oh crap! I always want to say Christian Bale, but that's not right. Uh, Guy Guy Pierce. Guy Pierce. Guy Pierce. Yeah, Guy Pierce. Phenomenal performance in that as well. Oh yeah. Okay. Next up here, we've got um, who was that? Was that Kenneth One Two Three that just sent yes. that? Yes. All right. Thanks for that, Kenneth. Uh, Phil Covelli writes. Finally saw the gentleman. Still my number one favorite movie of the year. Finally saw the gentleman and loved it. Don't piss off the lion. That movie. It's so quintessential, Guy Ritchie. Uh, have you seen Gentlemen yet? Remember, we talked about this. I can't understand what they're saying. Oh, that's right. Oh, my God. I love this movie so much. <laughs> oh, my God. I love Gentlemen so much. I, I just I think I'll watch it again today. Damn it. I will watch it again today. I'm so glad you watched it. I'm so glad you enjoyed it. It's really neat. It's the first time I've seen that girl from Downton Abbey in anything else other than Downton Abbey, too. And I thought she was really great. And she played a great like tit for tat with, as uh, Matthew McConaughey's wife in that. She was great in it. Uh I just love it. It's my number one movie of the year so far in a very turncated year, obviously. Suthius writes, I can't wait to go back to the filthy stores again. I get, I listen, I cannot wait to go back to restaurants. I cannot wait to just go walking into a normal store. I cannot wait to go to the movies. I mean, I'm ready for this whole thing to be behind us. I mean, we got to be patient. We got to be smart. Be safe. Take care of ourselves. Take care of everybody else around us. We got to do all the right things. But man, I'm not going to lie. I cannot wait for this. Do you have bullshit. a particular restaurant or a particular like, ha- have you decided like, OK, once this is done, this is the thing that I'm really like, what's the what's the number one thing that you're like, oh my God, this is going to be so awesome. Yeah. Other than going back to the movie theaters, which is obviously my number one thing. It's just part of getting back to my routine. There's a restaurant here in town called Cafe O that has a great outdoor uh, patio, a huge oh, outdoor patio with love great seating patios. and stuff like that. And it's also a hookah lounge. So Anne, likes, Anne and Corey like to get hookah while we're there. I go there like three times a week, mm-hmm. bring my iPad, sit down, order a Diet Coke, get get a little finger food, write my show notes for the next day, sit out on the patio outside, just enjoy. I mean, that it's just part of the regular routine. Yeah. I am so looking forward just to going. You got one that you're like the first thing you want to do? Um, I don't know if it'll be the first thing that I want to do, but it's definitely the thing that I'm looking forward to the most, which is I want to go see Rock of Ages with uh, a bunch of friends because it is my favorite musical. I love it. And I know so many people in the cast now, especially since Tom and I have been, you know, uh, working with, you know, Nick's with Nick's wife and um, <clears throat> With everything that's been going on, uh, I and I want to be I want to be able to dance and sing '80s music at the top of my lungs and drink beer and eat finger foods and just like rub up against a lot of rock and rollers. <laughs> <laughs> There's a t-shirt in there somewhere. I'm pretty sure. Well, that's There's another thing is that the shirt that they, they, I used to have this shirt that says hooray for boobies and it's from the show. Right. And I was actually emailing with, uh, or I was texting with one of the producers and I said, hey, you guys, I beat breast cancer. And so now I really need the hooray for boobies shirt. So I'm going to need you guys to get that back in the merch tent. So they're, they're bringing it back. Not just for me, but it's coming back. Yes. All right. Next up, Willow writes, uh, speaking of a uh, rena cage, we were talking about that the other day. Instead of the Renaissance, we're looking for a rena cage, a Nick Cage return. Uh, have you seen this old college humor sketch of Nicolas Cage's agent trying to stop him from signing up for bad movies? Yes. <laughs> agent Oscar Schindler's <laughs> List, not an action hero. Cage. He is now movie poster <laughs> of Cage and Schindler's List. I have. Have you seen this? Yes, and it is brilliant. It is everything that you imagine that it would be. Um, it's also there's there's another one uh, that. It's kind of similar of Scarlett Johansson's agent trying to prevent her from doing certain movies of playing certain <laughs> characters. Those two, but the Nicolas Cage one is hilarious because it's everything. It's it's the absurdity of the caricature that Nicolas Cage has become um, in all the ways that we love him. 
I I have never heard of this, and now I cannot Check wait to out. watch it. By the way, everybody still underestimates the reason Kick Ass worked, and because Kick Ass Two didn't work as well, it's because it was missing Nick Cage. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. All right, D Train writes one of two. I honestly think it would be a good idea if Tenant keeps their release date. Really, uh, if everything goes well worldwide with the pandemic by June, then that is when you can bust out the marketing uh, one month marketing mm. ramp up i don't know that that's enough time like i'm the one always arguing for a shorter window but one month might be too limited uh, when you can bust out the marketing they could release a new kick-ass trailer not the literal kick-ass uh give us some new posters couple of tv spots maybe it would have a slogan that says tenant the movie that wasn't afraid of covid19 uh, which i think could make people think you know what i'm gonna give this movie my money because it held it held its ground people will come i disagree d train uh here's here's the problem you face number one one month is not enough for a big major. This was an expensive movie. This was a very expensive movie. One month is not enough of a ramp up time. Number two, when you do reopen theaters, like we were talking about, it's going to take a little while for people to get back into the flow of going to the movies again, right? There's going to be a bunch of us that are like, day one, I'm there. Day one, I'm there. A uh, little eco mod in there. Anyway, day one, I'm there. So there's going to be a lot of people that do that. But there's also going to be a lot of people like uh, Aaron and I were both saying a little bit earlier, it's going to be a little bit more cautious, aren't going to want to go out right away. And I'm sorry, they're not going to go, well, I was nervous about going out, but damn it, Tenet held its ground. I, I, I don't think that's going to change a lot of people's minds. But listen, I'll tell you what, D-Train, in the Hollywood business, nothing is impossible. And I would love it if they did. I, personally, I would love it if they did. I just don't think they will. I don't think there's any real reality here that they do keep that date. But never know. And I would love to go see Tenet in July. Holy crap, I would love that. All right, Tarek D writes, Hey, John and Co., I just got done watching the Godfather trilogy for the first time. Good nice. on you, man. So now on to another classic, The Lord of the Rings. However, I'm not sure if I should watch the theatrical or extended versions of the film, so which do y'all suggest thanks? First of all, uh, dying of jealousy that you got to watch The Godfather for the first time ever, and now equally dying of jealousy that you get to watch Lord of the Rings for the first time. Some people may disagree. Absolutely, you start with the theatrical versions. I think you 100% start with the theatrical versions. Now, having watched the theatrical versions, later on you can go back and watch the extended stuff to see the extra stuff that they put in there. But honestly, I think the theatrical versions are the way to go. Uh, Aaron, you know, there's regular length versions of films, theatrical, mm -hmm. then, then extended cuts. Which would you recommend, or does it depend on a case-by-case -case basis that people start off with? No, I think you, I agree with you. You start with what was put into the theaters, and if you like it, then there's always more. I think that this is a uh, less is more kind of situation. You may not necessarily respond, I mean, regardless of how well the film is crafted. For some people, they're just not into that kind of fantasy type of film. And so watch the trilogy, see what you think. If it's something that you're excited about, you can, like John said, you can always go back and uh, wet your whistle with a little bit more. But um, also, if it's not necessarily your cup of tea and you've already invested in the extended version, you're kind of stuck. All right, next one up here. Canada Rock Strikes. John, you've spoken highly of director Dexter Fletcher's Rocket Man and Eddie the Eagle. I would like to recommend his fun 2013 jukebox musical Sunshine on Leith. I've mm. not heard of that. Based on songs from the Scottish band The Proclaimers. <gasps> I would walk 500 miles. <laughs> um, and starring 1917's uh, George McKay. I oh, have I never him. heard of this film. I, I've never even heard. Aaron, are you familiar with this? I'm Sunshine not. on Leith. Sunshine Leith? on. What's the last word? L e i t h. L e i t h. Leith. 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 I'm not sure. I've never heard of the film. But is it, it sounds. A, is that a Scottish word? I can only. I can only assume at this point because hey, uh, listen, our international viewers. What does Leith mean? Yeah, because Please I'll tell you what. At I, me and let me know. I do like. I've been talking about Eddie the Eagle recently, which I, I just adore that movie. I haven't seen it. Oh, it's but so But I loved good. Rocket Man. Right. It, and so, like, you got Taron Egerton, you got Hugh Jackman, um, and it's basically, it's the story of Eddie the Eagle from the from the Calgary Olympics back in 1980, whatever it was. And it's so charming. It's so well done. But yeah, this is a movie I've not heard of before, Canada Rock, so thanks for putting it on my radar. All right, Greg Scott Bailey writes, follow up on my fringe fun fact, season two, episode 16, Peter, is where you see Back to the Future starring Eric Stoltz on the theater marquee in the background. A bunch of people sent me still images from that episode, by the way. Look, it's hilarious. Another fun fact, Elijah Wood is one of the kids in Back to the Future part two playing the arcade game in Cafe 80s. What? 
What? Really? Wow. Is that, Chapboard, is that actually true? Because, um, oh, by the way, somebody's writing into the chat, the, uh, a leaf is a superb, I think you probably meant suburb, is a suburb of Edinburgh, Scotland, my grandmother's oh. home. Okay, so that makes that makes sense. The sunshine on the leaf? Yeah, on, or sunset on leaf, whatever it was. Sunsh it was sunshine of something. Sunshine on leaf. Okay, I, we'll look it up. I love finding out like these fam people who later became famous and they were just a tiny little somebody in the background of something. I had no idea about that. Uh, I will have to look that one up because I never knew that. Did you have, you, I'm guessing by your reaction, you didn't know that either. I did not know that. But in my favorite movie, Cool Hand Luke, a very young Dennis Hopper is yep. one of the, uh, okay, that's like, everybody knows that. Yeah. No, no, no. I, I don't think a lot of people do, but because not a lot of people have watched Cool Hand Luke these days, which is really Such unfortunate. Anyway, thank you for the follow up on that, Greg. That's kind of cool info. Grand Moth Kevin writes. Hopefully, Erin is still on the show when you read this question. She is. Uh-oh. Because I would love to hear her take on the topic of actors who do not watch their performances uh, discussed here two days in a row. We'll make it three days in a row. Okay, so just quick synopsis here. Okay. This is the, the quick catch-up on this. So uh, a, a question came in about uh, how many actors do or how many actors should you know, watch their own performances. My take on it is this. If I was a director, I would insist my actors watch their stuff because like, just like football players... After a game, they spend three days in the film room analyzing their own things, learning their own tendencies, mm -hmm. trying to figure out how to improve. I think the same as me, whenever I do, you know, I've told you this many times. As soon as I'm done a podcast, as soon as I'm done a video, I rewatch it because I got to see, I got to keep on top. What are some tendencies I'm developing? How do I right. correct it? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, how do I improve if I can? You know, all that kind of stuff. And I believe the same is true of actors. I mean, I don't think <laughs> a Daniel Day Lewis does, but he's the greatest of all time. So whatever. <laughs> but what's your position on that? Should, should actors review their own work? It's tricky because for me, when I first started acting, it was very challenging for me to watch because I watched all the wrong things. Um, I was very uh, in, insecure about my performance, about my performance, and I was therefore insecure about everything. And I would go, "Oh, my arm looks fat there," or "Oh, I, you know, I feel like my hair was done weird." Like I would look at all the physical aspects of it, and then as time went on, and I was able to let go of a lot of those insecurities about my looks, then it became more about, well, what am I watching? Do I believe this moment? And then you're right, what are my physical tendencies? The first on-camera class that I ever took, I noticed that my, uh, my eyes would dart to the left all the time. Well, if you've ever studied the uh, behavioral sciences, you know that that's one of the tells of someone who's lying. So when mm. you're having a conversation with someone, if their eyes keep darting to the left, that's a tell of lying. Doesn't mean that if their eyes are not darting that they're not lying, but it is certainly a tell. And I noticed in moments of dialogue that I didn't believe, my eyes would start darting to the left. And I was like, wow, that's so fascinating. When I'm not dropped in, I my body gives away that I think I'm lying. So those were certain behavioral patterns, behavioral tics. Um, I do think that it is always a good exercise for an actor, but if you're one of those actors that's just gonna get in your head and make it about something else and not look at it through the eyes of an athlete. You know, I, I grew up as a dancer, so for me, I'm a more technical performer. I like to know how the lighting works. I like to know, I always ask the camera operator, you know, what frame are we at? It makes a big difference if I know that we're here versus in a two shot. So I like to watch, but I also respect an actor who says, you know what? It doesn't help me if I watch it. So I don't think that there's a should or a should not. For me, I like to, for others, they don't. All right, uh, there you go from an actress's perspective. Dan Ketchum writes, uh, I meant to say that it should be hauled away as garbage uh, back when Klingons just had good tans and no lobsters on their heads. I can't remember what the original thing to that was, but I love the message anyway, Dan. Uh, back when Klingons just had good tans and no lobsters on their head. Yep, Klingons looked very different in the original series than they do now. All right, Major Tom writes, um, hey, John, one of two. Hope all is well. Uh, since you really like Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, and Hero, I've got a couple of Korean films for you to check out uh, that are similar. One, Shadowless Sword. I like Shadowless Sword. Uh, it's directed by a game named Kim Joon Young. Uh, directed. It's, it's this tale about 
uh, kind of like an imperial family murdered that, but there's one long kind of lost member of the family and this master swordsman is her responsibility to go and bring that person. But anyway, it's a real fun little film. So you check it out if you get a chance. Uh, number two, um, Memories of the Sword. I'm not familiar with that one. Uh, both are set in ancient Korea. Um, Shadowless Sword is about a female warrior who is tracking down the last surviving member of the royal family so he can reclaim the throne. Memories of the Sword is about a young girl who seeks revenge for the death of her mother. Excellent movie. Some of the best movies of that genre are revenge based. Mm. I love good revenge films, which is awesome. And, and yeah, Shadow of Sword, look, it's not hero. It's not Shaolin versus Llama. Uh, it's not whatever, but it's a, it's a nice little movie. I like Shadow, Shadowless uh, Sword, but I really like the sounds of this other recommendation of yours, Memories of the Sword. That one I'm not familiar with, but it's a young girl who seeks revenge. Love that. Sounds good to me. Sign me up, Major Tom. Thanks for the recommendation, man. All right, B. Nora writes, uh, the next Spider-Man movie is going to be called Spider-Man Stay at Home. It's Peter Parker <laughs> watching Netflix doing house chores and talking to MJ and Ned on Zoom. <laughs> Some great. Actually, somebody made somebody sent me a meme of that. Oh, really? Yeah, because you know it's it's Spider-Man uh, Homecoming, Spider-Man Far From Home. And so, that somebody actually sent me a fake poster of Spider-Man Stay at Home, and it's like Spider-Man it. sitting down in front of his computer hanging out with a big Thor beer belly probably a little bit something like that mm -hmm. at the same time so i like the idea of being nora all right next up joshua levesque writes hey john from one film fan to another i just want to thank you for all the content since i started watching 2014 thank you so much for that joshua also what do you think of the patriots Q qb situation i'm not sold on uh stidham yet i think they should draft jalen hurts from oklahoma i don't think they're going to have the opportunity to, to i'll be frank with you i don't if you can get jalen hurts you should get jalen hurts I mean, there's one or two QBs in this year's draft that I would take ahead of Jalen Hurts, but Jalen Hurts, I believe, is going to be a very good NFL quarterback. I've always kind of thought Jalen Hurts, but from when he was on Alabama uh, to his transfer to Oklahoma, I thought Jalen Hurts always played the style of game that wasn't best for college, but is probably more built for the NFL. But look, he, they're not going to have the opportunity. I think he's going to be long gone uh, by the time uh, the... the uh, the Patriots get around to drafting. By the time they get their draft pick, I, I don't think Jalen Hurts is still on the board. And quite frankly, they have a few other bigger holes that they need to fill right now. So it's going to be interesting to see how that turns out. All right, Anthony Lucalano writes, Finished watching with Nail and I, Robert E. Grant film that Robert loves so much. Uh, last night, I can absolutely see why it's regarded as such a cult classic. Fantastic comedy. Again, it's too bad Rob wasn't here when you brought this up because he loves that movie. And obviously, he's a huge fan of Richard E. Grant, who's in the film as well. So I'm glad you liked it, man. Uh, Anthony follows up watching. No, I got what you meant, man. I got what you meant. All right. Uh, Akash Telly writes, with all the recent images of Dune being released, do you think a trailer is around the corner? No. Remember, you can get a lot of times images. But what normally is the harbinger of a trailer dropping normally is when the official poster drops. Mm. Usually, not always, but about 70% of the time, when an official poster drops, usually within the next 48 hours, the first trailer drops. Dune is still, what are we now, in April? April. April, April 16th. Okay. So May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December. We're still eight months away. Yeah. I, I think it's <laughs> way too early for them to drop. So yeah, some, some promotional images got released in Vanity Fair. That's one thing. I'll tell you this. If in the next week or so they actually drop the poster, like the official poster, yeah, we might have to keep our eyes open for a trailer, but I don't think a trailer's coming anytime soon. Like, not within the next, certainly not within the next month. I don't think so. Aaron, do you think they might drop one well, and surprise us, or do you think it's going to wait a little while? Is Dune coming out on VOD? No, no, it's coming out in December, theatrical. Then there's no reason. It would be a waste of, it, it would be a waste to do it now. Yeah, it's just too big and expensive a film. Yeah. And there's, there's there's no, no point reason in doing to do it. that. I agree. All right. Uh, next up. Uh, oh, but it would be great if they did. All right. Orange Hand writes, I like Far From Home, but that bar scene where Beck reveals himself is just so badly written. I wish somebody spoke up and said, this needs a rewrite. I agree. I agree. Like, I like Spider-Man Far From Home very much. I think I prefer Homecoming. But Far From Home is really good. But that scene is a little bit too much. Well, we're the bad guys. Let's go over bit by bit how we are the bad guys and how all of us as bad guys got involved in this plot, nefarious plot, blah, blah, blah. It was way too on the nose. It was way too on the nose. Um, so I agree. I like the movie too. 
but I thought that was a badly executed scene. I mean, it was fun, but it was also a badly executed scene, I believe, in the midst of a, of a pretty damn good movie. But it I It sounds agree like you. one of those scenes where some executive was like, I don't really understand what's going on. I feel like you need a scene that just explains it all. And yeah. that, like it, it, that sounds like a suit note. Yeah, it's it's a little yeah, it does. It's it's just too on the nose that scene. So I agree with you, Orange Hand, on that. All right, Stephen Alexander uh, sends in a fifty dollar chat. Thank you for that, Stephen, for the supporting us on that level. And again, if there's a question in here, we will not only answer it right now, we will answer it in its own standalone video as well. Which, by the way, we got a new batch of those fifty dollar tip question videos going up on the channel a little bit later today. Keep your eyes open for that. Anyway, I want to congratulate you and Anne for the move. Not moved yet, so keep that in mind. I've met both of you individually, uh, you at the AMC Burbank and Anne when I used to work for Starbucks. Both of you are so kind and respectful. Before you leave, are you planning on having a going away event? I, I don't think so. And part of the reason for that is because um, like we're gonna be leaving in stages. So like whenever they open everything back up and people are allowed to go back into offices, because my wife, Ann, just got a, a job. She is now like one of the senior whatever at Amazon. So <laughs> senior whatever at Amazon. Um, so, but obviously their offices are closed. So she's working remotely right now. So she's working from home. Whenever they do open the offices back up in a month or two months or three months or whenever, She'll, we'll go out there, we'll find a, we'll find an apartment or something and she'll be there. I need to be here for the next maybe six months uh, while I finish my movie. So we will just fly back and forth. Sheena, she'll come back here for weekends. I'll fly out there for three or four days at a time. And that's what we'll do for a couple of months. So we're actually gonna be leaving in stages. So no, probably won't have any kind of going away event. And, and even then, I don't know how long we'll be gone. Like I'm still probably gonna be coming back to LA a lot for different things and all that kind of stuff. And it will probably be living back in LA again. Who knows? Amazon may transfer her to LA in six months. I mean, we just don't know. So no, no big going away event, but I appreciate that. And and, and thank you for introducing yourself. I, I don't remember the specific circumstances, but just the fact that you came up and said, hi, I appreciate that. It always makes me feel like a million bucks. It really does. So thank you to all you guys when that happens. And thank you, Steve, for sending that in. Thank you for the well wishes and thank you for supporting the channel on that level, man. We really appreciate it, dude. Have a fabulous day. All right. Uh, Christian301291 writes, Hey, John, do you think it's more likely that we see Thor in Guardians 3 or Guardians in Thor 4? Uh, congrats mm -hmm. to Anne for the new job. Ooh, that's a good question. I'm that gonna is a great question. I'm going to say this. Because we heard Chris Pratt come out and say, because somebody asked Chris Pratt, like, hey, man, were you disappointed that Thor wasn't going to be in Guardians 3? And Chris Pratt said, who says Thor isn't going to be in Guardians 3? That I mean, that's not necessarily confirming that he will be, but it may certainly go, oh. Mm -hmm. I think, first of all, it's possible that it's both. Sure. But if I had to say one was more possible than the other, I'd say it's more probable we see, at minimum, a Thor cameo in Guardians 3. That's my guess. What do you think, Aaron? Well, just logistically, my producer brain goes, okay, it's more realistic for us to be able to get um, Chris Hemsworth to do a couple of days, you know, at minimum in Guardians versus having, uh, who are we getting? We're getting Vin Diesel for his voiceovers. We're getting Bradley Cooper for his voiceovers. We're getting um, Chris Pratt and Zoe Saldana and um, who's our guy that we love, Dave Batista. Batista. We're getting all of these people, the logistical nightmare of getting all the Guardians together for a Thor film. Uh, Yes, it can be done and it would be great and I would love to see it done. But if it's going to be a one or the other, from a producer standpoint, it's definitely Thor being in Guardians. But I don't know that you've been here when we've talked about this. Did I you haven't. hear who they announced is going to be the villain in Thor 4? No. Christian Bale. Yeah, what? Christian Bale's the villain. They haven't re revealed who the villain. We have our theories, but we have we don't know who wow. he's playing. But yeah, hey, okay, Christian Bale, you get a taste of the of the superhero world, and you're all about it. I love that. Which, which, which is crazy because back in the day, during the Dark Knight Rises, uh, we had interviewed him for AMC back in the day, mm -hmm. and one of the things he told us that he was. He's done with comic book movies. Sure, it's just that not not that he hated them. It's just that yeah, I've done the comic book thing. I'm yeah. I'm I'm not going to be doing comic book movies anymore. Well, I guess twelve years or ten years or however long it's been since that came out can change a lot of things. Or maybe he just wants to put a new extension on his house. Or that maybe. <laughs> or he just saw what Taika Waititi is doing in movies like Jojo Rabbit and whatever. And he's thinking, yeah, I want to work with this guy. Whatever yeah. the case is, 
I'm excited as hell. Okay, uh, let's do a couple more here before we have to let Aaron uh, get out of here because, you know, Joey Bishop is is waiting. Uh, let's see. Midnight Madman writes, Can high fantasy species like elves, orcs, and dragons be put in a modern slash tech setting or should they remain in the sword and sandal era? Also, don't ever say emo Stephen Strange. Be careful what you wish for. Yeah, saying, yeah. Hey, listen, I love the idea that Sam Raimi's directing Doctor Strange too, as long as we don't get, you know, black wearing emo Stephen Strange like we got in <laughs> Spider-Man 3. Um, no, you totally can. And listen, when you look at like even a lot of game stuff, like modern and tech are two different things, like tech more futuristic yeah, because if you even look at a game like Warhammer 40,000, we've got a lot of, like, yeah, space orcs and whatever, like, different things. There's a lot of different high fantasy stuff that does involve the different races and things like that in a future setting. You can. I admit I'm more comfortable in the sad, uh, sand and, uh, and sword kind of uh, stuff like that, like a Lord of the Rings setting. I prefer that myself, but you could absolutely do something. If you came up with the right concept, there's definitely stories and IP out there that exist already that have that things like that. You could do it. Um, we're more comfortable with it set in the in the classical settings, but it's possible. It's absolutely is possible, Midnight. All right, Jonathan Joyner writes, Hey, John, I took your suggestion and watched a good old-fashioned orgy. Good on you. <laughs> uh, and it was a good time. All, also, finished Ozark. And, John, the last two minutes of the finale will make you replay it because you won't believe what you've seen and that you saw it because you wouldn't see it coming. I didn't fail you on Harley Quinn, so believe the hype, brother. Well, first of all, so for those of you who don't know, uh, and Aaron, I don't know if I've, you've heard me talk about this film before. Yes, but, good old-fashioned orgy. Oh, mm -hmm. God. I, I think it's just a, not a top <clears throat> 10 comedy of all time or anything like that, but just a good, fun, charming Jason Sudeikis, Lake Bell. Um, it's just a good, fun little movie that I enjoy greatly that nobody saw. So if you get a chance to see it, I do recommend you you go and check it out. How does it compare to Hot Rod? Because you highly recommended Hot Rod as a laugh out loud and I started watching it and I was not LOLing. No, 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 no. No, I didn't. Oh, well, uh, it was, my, the pop, my it was buddy, pop Star. Yeah, Pop Star I love. My okay, buddy so I recommended started watching, Hot Rod. I wanted to watch Pop Star and Tom said, no, let's watch Hot Rod. And so we started watching Hot Rod and I said, I don't think this is very funny. It's kind of dumb. And he said, well, this is, well, pop star is basically this. And so he no. said, if you don't like this, you're not going to like pop star. I disagree. Cause I'm not a, I'm not a big fan of, of, um, hot rod either. And my, okay. my editor who, you know, uh, Chuck Norris, you've met Chuck. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and yes, his real name is Chuck Norris. Um, I he, have a friend named Andy Samberg. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> so he, desperately recommended because he loves 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 um uh what, what movie you're talking about again hot rod hot rod he loves hot rod and got me That's to watch so it for the dumb. first time and i i didn't mind it i didn't mind don't get me wrong i, I will hate say hot rod. the spoof on the footloose dancing scene when all of a sudden there's a random pummel horse in the middle of this like that that was funny when he does it in the middle of the forest and there's like a pummel horse randomly and which totally works because when kevin bacon is doing it and he all of a sudden gets on a pommel horse you're like what what the fuck are you doing what, what is so happening here right now random I, um, that was funny but outside i was like nah, nah. but i as somebody who thought all right i was okay i mean i i just but i don't hype it up as much as a lot mm -hmm. of people do a lot of people love it and that's great and I, I i don't have a problem with it it's just not really for me but I love pop star. Okay. Well, I'm just going to have to override Tom on this. He's yeah. sort of the king of the remote around our house. Um, so, which is why we watch. But I will say that the first the half of the movie is times. the first half is stronger than the second half, but okay. I really like pop star. I thought All pop right. star was, just, it's very silly, but just really, really fun. All right. Uh, let's see here. Um, and oh God. And if you haven't started watching Harley Quinn, have you and Tom started watching Harley Quinn? The animated series? No. Yeah. Oh, watch it. Okay. And, Anne and I, there was a part, we just watched season two, episode two, mm -hmm. and there's a silly little part of it that Anne's just started dying laughing, and she had to keep pausing and rewinding it just to watch this scene okay. over and over again. What do I watch this on? It's on the DC streaming service, so you can sign up for it for like five or six bucks. Okay. I know, yet another streaming just service. Just another, like, I'm like, just package yourselves, guys, just package yourselves, and you know what, please. I think it's going to be on uh, HBO Like, I'll Max. happily pay $20. I just don't want to have to keep, and then the passwords for everything is just too much. Um, I think it's going to be on HBO Max. Oh, great. Well, then I'll when just it wait comes, for that. But honestly, it's worth, sign up for it now. Okay. So you can binge all of season one. 
And then, and then they only had a one month break between the end of season one and starting season two, which made me very, very happy. This show is so good, and I only discovered it because I thought it looked stupid as hell. And just everybody on yeah, the, you've talked about it quite a bit. All the fans so just kept telling it. me to watch it, and I'm like, fine, I'll Have watch you this watched stupid bullshit. Sharp Objects on HBO. No, never heard of it. It's Amy Adams. It is the oh, I know yes, the show you're talking about, but I have, no, I have not seen it. I have you not seen have it though. To. It is. It is the most beautiful display of performance I have I have seen. I, I can't even think of another one. And this is this is how I know that it's so great. Is even this small one day? Like a lot of times, shows that shoot outside of Los Angeles and New York, they'll have you know you have your main casting in LA and New York, but then they'll have local casting for the one day guest stars. And a lot of times, you can tell. Like we'll, Tom and I will be watching a show. We were watching Deadwood, and I was like, that person's that person's a local. And you can tell sometimes. And I'm not saying this to disparage all the local actors. There's some phenomenal actors that are New Orleans based, Atlanta based. But sometimes, because there's not as wide of a pool to cast from, those one-day guest stars, the people that come in and they have a couple lines, they just really stick out, especially when they're working with phenomenal actors like Amy Adams. And in this show, there's even a scene where there's a woman, she's a cancer patient and she's a, uh, she's a meth addict, and she and her son, one-day guest stars, phenomenal so good that i assumed that they would be in much bigger parts in the show i highly highly Get, highly it recommend it sharp objects a girlfriend of mine recently discovered that her mother has munchausen syndrome by proxy which if you're not familiar with that it's a mental disorder that causes oftentimes mothers to uh, intentionally poison or harm their children so that they can take care of them if you ever saw flowers in the attic or the act, it's based on that very real situation. My girlfriend, when she was telling me about this, she said, Sharp Objects is the closest thing I have ever seen to what it's really like. And so I watched the show so I could be in more, in support of my friend, and I was blown away. It, it, okay. it is phenomenal. But okay. big, big question here. Yes. Does it have a giant shark human creature called King Shark in it? You know what? Spoiler alert, <laughs> the last episode, I wasn't going to say anything. <laughs> King Shark shows up. Yeah, King Shark, by the way, uh, Funches does the voice of King Shark and Harley Quinn. So, I mean, if it doesn't have a giant walking shark right. that e bites people's heads off as he's walking down the street, <laughs> then I don't know if it sounds so good. So, but, so Harley Quinn, Sharp Objects, and Best Little Orgy in Texas, what were we talking no, no, about? No, uh, a good old-fashioned Good old-fashioned orgy. orgy, and of course, Best Little Whorehouse in Texas. And of course, Best Those Little Those are our required watching for the week. With uh, with uh, Dolly, Parton Dolly Parton and, and Burt Reynolds. Burt Reynolds. Um, okay, last question that we'll, we'll bring up here. And then we got, oh, I've kept Aaron over time. So, okay. okay. Mandalorian of Gondor writes, one of two. Hey, John, the last movie I saw in theaters was 1933 King Kong, courtesy of Fathom Events. Nice. It was great seeing it on the big, the last one I saw in theaters was, uh, was Onward which is a really nice little experience. Um, courtesy of Fathom Events, it was a great It was great seeing it on the big screen, but wow, that stop motion was incredible for its time, uh, even it's even if it's a bit dated. I can see why Jackson is a fan. Speaking of Fathom, how do you think they'll handle their schedule? I had plans to see the 20th anniversary of Gladiator and Crisis on, on Earth fan event. Do you think they'll postpone later or just flat out cancel because they always plan, pardon me, plan schedules a year in advance? Thanks. Well, I mean, it's hard to say what these individual companies will do with individual release dates. The nice thing about Fathom Events is these are the types of movies, it's these types of events that are actually perfect for when the theaters reopen, to be honest with you. These are the types of events that theaters can reopen with because you're not going to have big brand new releases on day one when the theaters reopen. It's going to be catalog titles and things like Fathom Events. So I think if the availability of the theaters is there, I think they'll keep their schedule. I really do. I mean, in so far as uh, at least as long as the theaters are available, I think this is the exact type of stuff they should do. Aaron, what do you think they're going to do with these Fathom Events titles? Yeah, I agree with you. You know, it, like we've already said a lot on this show already today, it's going to take a while for people to feel comfortable going to the theater. Not everybody, of course, as you said, there's going to be people that race back, but the gener the general viewing public, they're going to need to really, you know, s ease into the water and feel comfortable and safe. And these types of films that are not going to require a big budget marketing, um, <clears throat> a big 
a big marketing budget. Um, the, these are the perfect opportunities for people to feel comfortable going back to the theaters without the risk of studios losing a lot of money and sort of, pardon the pun, blowing their load on you know a, a brand new film. All right. Well, with that said, we have kept you long enough here. And I know Joey Bishop is downstairs with Anne waiting for you. So in the meantime, Aaron, where can people follow you and all of your adventures online till we see you here again next week? Yes, you can find me at Aaron L. Cummings. And uh, please, as I said before, at the, at the top of the show, uh, check in. We're going to have a dance party to wake up Nick Cordero from his COVID coma at 3 p.m. Pacific time today. So tune into our story to my story for that. And uh, otherwise, I will be back at home sewing masks for our first responders and I hope that you'll join me in doing that as well all right guys thanks so much for being here Aaron and we will of course see you again next week all right guys with all that down let's keep right on rolling here we still got about uh 12 minutes here to go so let's get through as many of these as we can Frank uh Van Varhusen I always mispronounce your name and you know that I do uh hi guys here I am again I had a discussion uh, with my brother about uh if they do sorry I have a discussion with my brother about if they do how they should make a Sinister Six movie. Uh, should they should they follow mostly The Six or Spider-Man? We've seen how they screw up with multiple villains. I feel like they should follow The Six in the first two acts and then the third with Spider-Man 2. I, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't see them. Like, here's the bigger, the bigger issue to me. I don't see them doing Sinister Six anytime soon. I think Sony got very, they know they screwed up the the Amazing Spider-Man 2. They know they screwed that one up. And they knew they got bit in the ass with their big pursuit of trying to force in a Sinister Six thing. I just don't think they're near ready to do a Sinister Six. I just don't think they're near ready to do it. And I think if you do a Sinister Six thing, I still think it has to be Spider-Man centric. I, I really do. I think you need for the movie audience to really be into it. I still think it needs to be Spider-Man centric. And if they do it. But again, I think we are far off from getting a Sinister Six uh, type of thing. I really do. Again, I think Sony's going to be very, very trigger shy about that for good reason. Uh, it's a very difficult thing. It, it's difficult to bring in multiple heroes, let alone to do things with big, a huge amount of multiple high profile, top A-list villains at the same time. And they, they took a shot at it. They dropped the ball badly on it. I think they're going to be very cautious about that. So I think it's going to be a while. But when they do, However many years down the road that is, I still think it needs to be Spider-Man centric for the audience to really get into it. I think focusing on the Sinister Six themselves will be really appealing to the hardcore comic book fans. But let's face it, the hardcore comic book fans represent maybe 5% of the movie going audience or less. So I still think it needs to be Spider-Man centric. But who knows? There could be a lot of different ways that the apple falls from this tree. Let's see how it shakes out moving uh, down the line, Frank. Thanks for sending that in, man. All right. Next one up. Comes to us from uh, Senorashish. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that. Writes in, why not have studios give souvenir PPE? Uh, example, Wonder Woman 84, Bond, Tenet, Soul, etc. Face masks with the purchase of a ticket for moviegoers to use in the theater to help uh, ass ass assuage their fears of sitting in a packed movie theater during pandemic. Listen, and that could be a part of what we call the new normal, Right is I wouldn't be surprised at all, and I mentioned this the other day, I wouldn't be surprised at all if part of movie-going experience might be at the front doors of the theater, there is big bottles of hand sanitizer, and they say you have to sanitize your hands before entering the theater. I can see that being a thing. Maybe they give out masks. The idea of having a Wonder Woman 84 branded mask, at least for the first couple of months, that's actually not a bad idea. It's a very expensive idea. Um, and you want to make sure there's not a, sor uh, a shortage of proper masks being given to our healthcare professionals. But, I mean, in general, the, the idea is not bad. And it could be something they could do at the beginning. You know, to get people feeling and like, hey, unless you're eating our popcorn, you got to keep the mask down. Like if you're eating, fine, pull the mask up and eat, but then you got to pull the mask down when you're not eating. I don't know. That could be a part of it. It'd be expensive, but hey, to go to James Bond and have a no time to die with a big martini on the mask as a collectible. It, actually, that could be kind of fun. Who knows? That might be that might be one solution there, Sen. So thanks for writing that in. All right. Sen also writes. 
I'm a Man of Steel uh, fan, myself included. I love Man of Steel. I'm a Man of Steel fan uh, through and through. The more I watch the film, the more I love it. Amazing film. Just one question. Uh, that still irks me after all these years. What's uh, a dick splash? No, seriously. I'm not joking, John. Thanks. Honestly, I don't remember. I don't remember the reference in the movie. I love this film, and I don't remember the reference in the movie. So for you, Sen, everybody else in the live chat, respond to Sen on that. I, I can't remember. It sounds like just a cool little throwaway uh, thing that I make up all the time. All right. John, our goat Rodriguez writes, um, and sends in a big tip. Thank you so much for that, John. All right. I've noticed HBO Max hasn't announced a specific launch date or sign up and barely any marketing with everyone locked uh, and itching for new content. You'd think they go full steam ahead. What I'm basically saying is I want to give HBO Max my money. I mean, and that's, that's the thing. I don't understand like, for instance, there was a big conversation about whether that new short streaming service, Quibi, that, that, that plays their content in 10-minute bites, about whether they should launch now or wait. It's like, why not? Why not launch now? Like, people don't need to go to a location to watch Quibi. They watch it from their mobile devices. They, they can be anywhere. No need to delay the launch of that. I don't personally see any need to delay the launch of... Uh, I'm with you on this. I don't see any need for them to delay the launch of HBO Max, unless there's something big that I'm missing here, and that's always a possibility. I could be overlooking something here. But to me, it seems like a no-brainer. no, a no -brainer. Absolutely, you move forward with the launch. Uh, personally, and I don't know why they're not moving full steam ahead, unless a lot of their new original programming hadn't finished shooting by the time the lockdown happened. But I would think three months before launch date, they would have finished shooting a lot of their stuff. Not to mention, you're gonna have a lot of great library content on HBO Max. I think you're going to see a lot of people very excited to sign up for it. So I, I'm in agreement with you on this. I really am. All right. John also writes, one of two. One of the funniest things I've ever heard you say is when someone asked you what would be your reaction if Palpatine and Luke with lightsabers appeared and then upcoming in the then upcoming um, uh, Rise of Skywalker trailer and your response was, oh, you're already... Uh, you already know what's going to happen. I'm going to masturbate like a filthy ape. Uh, that was pure gold. I recently came across the old video from surfing through your channel. Yeah, I, dude, listen, I, I'm a Luke Skywalker guy. And I know that sounds stereotypical, but yes, I am definitely a Luke Skywalker guy. Luke Skywalker is my favorite Star Wars character. But other people can say Han Solo, and I love Han Solo. Other people can say, you know, Yoda, and I love Yoda. Uh, Luke's, I'm a Luke Skywalker guy. So yes, I desperately wanted in both The Last Jedi to see Luke Skywalker wreck fools. Didn't get it, but I still loved what they did, even though it wasn't what I was looking for. Uh, I was hoping to see him come back to life and do something cool, uh, Return to, or uh, Rise of Skywalker. They didn't, and I didn't like the movie. Not because of that, though. It, you don't have to do what I want you to do in a, in a movie for me to like it. It's just I just didn't like the movie. That's fine. But, oh, dude, it would have easily been R-rated stuff. You could not have had a camera on me if that happened because I would have I would have done filthy, filthy things, filthy, filthy things. If they had done that, I would have been excited that much, John. I absolutely would have been excited that much. All right. Thanks for sharing that. All right. K Major writes, John, no one is asking the important question. Why the hell are you going to Disney Plus looking for butt cheeks? Yeah, I, hey, listen, I agree. But now listen, to be fair to people, though, okay, Major, to be fair, I, I don't think people are saying, I want to see ass. I, I think they just, in principle, have a, a problem in principle about the notion of changing the art. And I think there is a debate to be had there. I think there is a good debate to be had there. I believe in this specific circumstance, it's a perfectly acceptable thing for Disney to want to put something on their network, just like all the other networks have done, that we want to just, they didn't, we, want, we don't want to cut a scene out. We're just going to extend the hair so it's safe for families. We won't have to worry about it. Again, I understand not liking the decision, I, but I don't understand having a problem with it. But again, I think there is a debate there to be had. And again, to be fair to people who do have a problem with it, it's not that they want to see ass, although we all want to see ass. It's not that they want to see ass. It's just that they have a, there's a principle at play here about whether or not you should ever touch art after it's been completed. That's a bigger discussion. And I think there is a discussion to be had there. So I may take one side of it, but I can totally understand people having, raising the issue for a topic for debate. Anyway, uh, Ryan Loner writes in, 
My favorite part of this Disney Plus censoring thing is that 10 Things I Hate About You is on it. You know, the movie uh, with the line, I have a dick on my face, don't I? And Alice and Janney uh, writing porn. I don't remember the film. I know exactly the movie you're talking about. I don't remember anything from it at all. I don't remember anything from it at all. Uh, but hey, it, it is what it is. I'm sure a lot of people are relating with what you're talking about. All right, Alvin Elmore writes, Cable, Thanos, Aquaman, Drax, and Poe Dameron are all in the same movie. Uh, I'm co- talking about Dune, of course. Uh, I'm confident this will be Denis' highest grossing movie. People are getting hyped over just the pictures. Remember, remember though, people in our little bubble are getting excited about the pictures. People like me are getting excited about the pictures, right? Um, it, it could be, it all depends on how they market this thing. It all depends on how they market this thing. Because if they put out stupid ass, dumb as hell, idiotic trailers like they did for Blade Runner 49, the people aren't going to come. If they're smart about their marketing, highlight the entertainment value of it, highlight the stars in it, give us a sense of what is this story about, then yes, it could it could very well be, be Denis. And by the way, Denis doesn't, it's not like he has a long list of big blockbusters. So it's not going to be hard to be his biggest film. So I hope it is. But I like, for instance, people like my mom aren't excited for Dune. Like the, I don't think a lot of the average film fan out there right now is excited about Dune just because of the pictures. I think there's people like me in this little bubble we're in are excited. But we'll see. It all, I believe, Alvin comes down to how do they market this thing. Because if they market it the way they marketed Blade Runner 2049, then this movie's dead. It doesn't matter how good it is. If they market this, because Blade Runner 2049 was really good, but nobody went to go see it because the trailer just made it look stupid. And if they do the same thing with Dune, the same thing's going to happen to it. If they're smarter about it, I think it can be a big success. But then again, we'll have to wait to see how good or bad the movie is. All right, last question of the day, guys. Comes to us from Hosea the Hoslayer writes, um, Sup, John? Man of Steel is my number one comic book movie. It's not my number one, but it's right up there, man. Uh, but I struggle to defend the scene in which Clark says to Pa Kent, what was I supposed to do? Let them die. And Pa Kent says, maybe. How do you interpret that scene? Respect, brother. Uh, sure. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. And I'll tell you why that scene is brilliant. For everybody who wants to moralize, and here's why I love that scene so much and the creative decision that Zack Snyder made in that scene. For everybody who wants to moralize, it's like, that's not right. Pa Kent should want him to help people. Okay, that's great in your fantasy world. That's great in your fantasy world. What Zack Snyder was trying to go for in that scene, though, was what would a real father say? What would a real father say? Because you know what a real dad eight times out of 10 would say in that stuff? Give it, give a father, give a parent a choice. My kid dies or 10 other kids die. If we want to be in magical fairy Star Trek land and think in Vulcan that the good of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one, sure, in theory, that's true. And in theory, you'd like to think to yourself, for the greater good, it is better that my child be sacrificed so 10 or 15 others can live. That's fine in a theoretical scenario. But what would eight parents out of 10 do? You're damn right they'd want their kid protected. That We're just genetically built that way. That's in our DNA. That's in our genes. If you have a child... Maybe if you thought about it for a year, you'd say, as painful it would as it would be, I would rather my own child be put at risk than all these other kids. What Pa Kent did in that scene, because remember, Pa Kent feared that the world being exposed to what Clark was meant the end of Clark. It was gonna, it was it, that it, the world wasn't ready for him, Clark wasn't ready for it, that the world finding out about Clark was gonna be the end of him. That's how Pa Kent in that scene. And in that movie felt he was desperate to protect his son. And he feared that his son exposing himself put him in extreme danger and an extreme extreme risk. And it's that as a father, as a parent, 
Maybe it's not in theory the right thing to say, but as a parent, and that's what he was acting on. You watch Kevin Costner in that scene, the emotion he plays and the way he says, maybe it was conflicted. It was, it was to me that that scene is brilliant. And I know a lot of people have a problem with it and fine, you have your problem with it. I thought it was effing brilliant because to use a word from Robert Meyer Burnett, it, it, it just, it was filled with verisimilitude. How would a parent actually in that spot concerned about their own child, how would they actually respond? And I contend that's exactly how most parents would react. That's exactly how most parents would react. Believing that if Clark got exposed now, it would be the end of Clark. It would end his life. That the world would want to prick and prod and take him and dissect him and do what? And just It's the world was not ready. That's what Pa Kent believed. And he was just thinking about the well-being of his son. That's why in the scene, what Pa Kent doesn't say is, yes, you're damn right you let those kids die. Even Pa Kent in that scene, if you watch it and analyze Costner's performance, even in that scene you saw Kent was... He was uh, conflicted about the answer. He was conflicted. Like, is even the way Clark puts it to him and says, what do you want me to do? Let them die? You could tell that in the performance of, of Costner there, there's a little bit of inner conflict. That's why he says he couldn't come out and say, that's right, you're my son and you do it. No, he said, maybe. Like, he, you could tell there was inner cloth there. I, 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 I swear to God, I... I get frustrated when I hear people have such a simplistic view of that scene. Oh, no, Pa Kent should have said, no, son, do what's for the greater good. That's not what a parent would have done. I don't know. I get worked up about this movie. I'm so all about Man of Steel. I get totally worked up. But anyway, that's how I interpreted that. Um, that scene, that moment. Um, that's how I got into it. And, and it, it, it's just why I, it's one of the reasons why I appreciate the movie so much because listen, I'm going to tell you what, and I know I'm going way long on this man of steel thing, but I'll tell you what else it, that scene kind of embodies the overall feel of verisimilitude that the rest of the film has, you know, Superman wouldn't have killed Zod. Guess what? This Superman in that situation faced with the unspeakable choice of either I have to end this Kryptonian's life or he's going to murder millions. There's nothing I can do to stop him. I got the upper hand on him right now. I've only been Superman for like 24 hours. This guy has been bred to be a military tactician and warrior that I have not been. And I'm not going to be able to stop this guy from killing millions. And I've got... He was faced with the choice and he made the choice that he needed to make. And that type of decision that Pa Kent made when he said, maybe, I think that's kind of a theme throughout the movie. And part of the reason why I, I love what Zack Snyder did in that film. I love what Zack Snyder did in that film. And I know a lot of people disagree with me and that's cool and that's fine, but that's the reason why it works for me. And I get very worked up when I start talking about Man of Steel. Um, so anyway, yeah, that's, that's that's just me. Um, anyway, guys, listen. For everybody else, uh, from Anthony Lucalano, uh, Sky Amazing Guy, Superman Steve, uh, and and on Diamond Dogs Puppy, and on. Listen, guys. There's still a bunch of questions here left to get through, but we've run a little bit over time here today. So I'm going to do a companion video later this afternoon. All the remaining questions that there are for today's show are going to be answered in a companion video a little bit later today. Keep your eyes open for that, and it will pop up a little bit later this afternoon because every single one of you sent in questions and supported the show. I'm going to answer every single one of your questions as they deserve to be properly in a video a little bit later today. Keep your eyes open for that. All right, guys. With that said, that wraps up our time here uh, on the show. Thank you so much for being here and making the show a part of your days. Thanks to Aaron Cummings for being here. Special thank you all you guys. Look, a lot of different things you can be doing today. And the fact that you chose to spend some of your time hanging out with us for a couple hours, your fellow film fans. Uh, 
that's really cool and, and I'm very aware of that and it's very honoring so thank you for spending time with us here today and a special thank you to all you guys who did send in the questions number one because you gave us great fun things to talk about but number two you actually supported the channel while you're doing it and all of us here are very very grateful you have our gratitude for that so thank you so much for that don't forget guys a little bit later today there will be a companion video also don't forget me and Robert Meyer Burnett will be back on here again tomorrow for the John Campus show there's already a couple of developing stories that we're going to be talking about uh, as we get to that so guys remember the four important things number one stay smart number two stay safe number three take care of yourself and number four take care of the people around you let's all do that and let's get this bs situation behind us just as fast as we can guys all my best to you and your families thanks so much for being here my name is john campia folks and until next time bye bye